Good day and welcome to the Each One Teach One channel. Um, this particular uh, video will be on scientific racism of popular culture. Um, happens to be early in the morning when this is being done, so pardon the uh, early morning vo voice, but I wanted to just get this out in case somebody was interested because the likelihood is this video. Oh, there we go. Grease with fire. There you go. All I needed was one person. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Now I can get into it a little bit more. Thank you for joining. Oh, I knew I should have known grown man would be in the building. Sorry, I doubted you and Chauncey and new black world. Yep. Sorry, I doubted you. Um, but thanks for joining this morning and i hope that i'll give you at least one to grow on youtube 91 see you i hope that it will get at least one to grow on and something to think about and the point of this in particular is just to begin to create more of the links between some of the topics to understand how they relate with each other and um, play with each other. Peace, J. Cal, um, in various ways. So you don't necessarily have to cut off one discipline or one area of focus when you may be looking at something that you perceive could be completely different and have no relationship to. So with that, um, Let's start with something the Woketopians um, get into to some degree, right? And this is the part where you could play along because this is information that you um, can view along with me if you, what is it? If you so choose. What am I on? Is this what I want to do? Okay. I think so. All right. So number one is we're going to go to Wikipedia. And we're going to go to scientific racism. Right. Let's start there. <clears throat> so scientific racism, I'm trying to make it a little bit bigger. You guys can also Wikipedia to see there's no um, Slide of hand tricks, scientific racism, sometimes termed biological racism, is the pseudo scientific belief that empirical evidence exists to support or justify racism, racial inferiority, or racial superiority. Historically, scientific racism received credence, which means that it was accepted throughout the scientific community. It was accepted science, but it is no longer considered scientific. The division of humankind into biologically distinct groups and the attribution of specific traits, specific traits, both physical and mental, to them by constructing and applying corresponding explanatory models, i.e. racial theories. It's sometimes called racialism, race realism, or race science by its proponents. Modern scientific consensus rejects the view as being irreconcilable with modern genetic research, right? So that's just, you guys can read that. This isn't, I'm not going to go loud to, to just show something you can do. I just want to be able to show you. So you have this enlightenment period and Names like Linnaeus, you may have heard of, or Bernier, or others, but Benjamin Rush. Um, I'm going to go right here. The French naturalist, Georges Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, and the German anatomist, Johann Blumenbach, were proponents of monogenism, the concept that all races have a single origin. Buffon and Blumenbach believed the degeneration theory of the origins of racial difference, right? I'm just going to skip through this a little bit. According to Blumenbach, there are five races, all belonging to a single, 
excuse me, all belonging to a single species, Caucasian, Mongolian, Negroid, American, and the Malay race, all right? So Blumenbach is the one that says, I have allotted the first place to the Caucasian for the reasons given below, which makes me esteem if the primeval one, all right? So with that said, we have a little background of scientific racism and some of the characters. And in particular, what this guy, we did this yesterday, Blumenbach said, right? Let me go home. But now, <laughs> so now we'll go to popular culture as in the form of newspapers. This one in particular comes out of Hampshire, England. It is October 24th, 1825. This is the accepted science of the era. These are his enlighteners during this period. Blumenbach in his elements of natural history divides the whole human species into following five races. The Caucasian race, color more or less white, yada, yada, yada. The Mongolian race, the Ethiopian race, the Ethiopian race, black in a greater or less degree with black frizzy hair. This is the point where you might want to jot some of these down. Jaw projecting forwards, thick lips, and flat nose. Composed of the remaining Africans, remaining Africans, remaining from what? There's the new, the Negroes who pass into the Moors by means of the Fullers in the same manner as other varieties merge into one another in consequence of their intercourse with the neighboring people. The others are because the Caucasians take Egypt and the Northern Africans. Lastly, it says under Caucasian, lastly, the Northern Africans. So Blumenbach, as you see, has taken Northern Africa and placed them under the Caucasian. Yet every other African is called a, this is 1825, Ethiopian. Okay? Okay. People who are new or may have just joined or whatever, trying to there's, there's a little bit of methodology to the madness. And usually what I like to do is give foundation for things. Just like the roller coaster ride when a guy ensures you that it'll be everything be fine and laughing and giggling while they're strapping you in. Before you realize that and eh, goes and you're going to go onto a crazy ride. But if they started off going hysterical before you even stepped a foot in, you're going to be completely out of your mind. So this is to give you a foundation and strap you in before it gets crazy. So we have scientific racism and we have these breakdowns, if you will, or, or um, races. And everyone in Africa except North Africans are called... Ethiopians, the Negroes, are called Ethiopians in science. Given what is now pseudoscience or scientific racism, physical characteristics or markers or identifiers with attributes like black frizzy hair, projecting jaws, thick lips, and flat noses. Hmm. Let's go to the chat for a second, see if y'all still with me. Y'all still with me? Do we get that? Did we get that, Zane? Kaba, there she is. Peace, Kaba. Did we get that so far? All facts. 
right? Didn't make anything up. We saw it from Wikipedia. For all the people say the Wikipedia scholars and all that other nonsense, to actual documentation of how is reported within and out to the masses close to the time period, right? This is a paper from England, 1825. Now, scientific racism part. Let's take a little ride. See, just want to start getting a little bit faster. Like, oh, this ain't going to be that bad. <laughs> Copper, you better tell him to buckle up. That's how the ride usually starts. Oh, it's going to be a smooth ride. Yeah, okay. So, we have this in popular conversation, culture, if you will. Yes, I think people can agree. Those who may be a little bit, have a little bit of information about scientific racism and how it played out. Well, we all know that the layman may not necessarily get his science completely from the hollow halls of university. It trickles down to the layman through various forms of other popular culture, because in order for something to be popular, listen closely, it has to be digestible and consumable by the masses, which means one, it can't be too heavy. It can't be too geeky and wordy. It can't be too deep because the populace does not want that. Look at popular music and all those things. This is why, on another note, verses, are, I mean, uh, choruses are the big sell. And why you didn't necessarily, why, here you go, let's give a modern example. Yes, Kendrick's album may have been critically held and whatever, but why the populace of Negro Dumb did not necessarily gravitate toward it like that? I'm America in general. I don't want to say that all of the all of the album records did sell well. Because some of the topics and the way that he rhymes about it is too heavy for consumption for the populace. This is why popular music, you hear words like catchy, right? And you go, oh, what's that song? Da, 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 da. That's you going through the verse da, 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 until you get to what? To the chorus, what you know for the song. Because that's the digestible and catchy part. Right? So science is done in the same way. You have mechanisms like Bill Nye, the science guy, who we have, uh, another person we have uh, elevated to the realm of godlike figure and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Right. That guy sat in the classes for the PhDs and the super science and all of the SAT words. We, the populace, consume it through him. We weren't. You understand where I'm going with this. This is how the populace has to consume. This. That's how things become popular. They have to be broken down in all type of ways just so people can consume them because they're not going to be as heavy as the Woketopians think. That's not popular culture. That's kind of why you're not popular. It's very convoluted. But in this case, this is how it's broken down for people to digest. Well, how are we taking all consideration, all these different type of faces and people? Well, here you go. Here's five things or whatever. But even still, this is the science of the day. Did we say? Not just say the popular masses don't necessarily consume it in that way. So how do they deal with these very varieties and distinctions of people that they're coming in contact with? How do they begin to have a way to explain who and what these people are to identify their physical, as it said in the Wikipedia article, and mental capabilities. <laughs> All right. Enough of the nerve speed. What happens when he moves from the scientific racism part of this to the popular culture? Well, 
what happens is the ride begins. So what this is, this is in popular culture and you have within the Americas, people dealing with how to understand, uh-oh, I hope y'all still with me, you still with me? Okay, y'all still with me, my, my screen just went blank for a second. Somebody will text me if I go haywire. Where was I going with this? I'm all over the place. Sorry for making your eyes like this. Here we go. Boom. So that happens. And now, <laughs> y'all better please listen good. This is going somewhere. So now what begins to happen is we need ways to understand things. How are things understood by the masses? How, were, how was the Bible taught or whatever? Well, there's religious plays that went all through and out of those religious plays let me give you a little this wasn't i uh, wasn't going to talk about this but like i say maybe this will help put together some links from other stuff religious let's just put plays play there's something in particular that i want to show you right let's look it up here probably be easier for how they start? Passion play, passion play. So, passion play. Maybe we'll start here and it'll take me where I want to go. Passion plays. Dramatic presentation depicting the passion of Jesus Christ, his trial, yada, yada, yada. These plays were how people learned about it because there was this, an assumption that people were literate, which they were not and were reading the Bible, which they were not. They learned about biblical stories and themes through plays. The origin and development of passion plays in the UK can be traced back to one of the earliest pieces of theater. Theater. Look at the terms I'm trying to connect. In Britain, which was the Quem Quartes, excuse me. Four lines spoken by two choirs addressing each other in dramatic form. So you have musical and song words relaying these messages via plays about religious themes. This is how the masses learned about biblical things because most of the population was illiterate. They were not reading the Bible. They had to memorize certain parts of the liturgy through repetition and through their versions of call and response, which were patterns to, you know, communicate these things. So you have these passion plays that come out. And from these, you have something that gets way heavy, and I'm not doing all this today. Get into Comedy Del Art from Italy. Whole other X, yeah, your boy gets deep. Well, you this is where you start to see characters like Clown that you may be aware of emerge. Matter of fact, y'all not gonna say I'm just talking smoke, trying to sound smart. Garibaldi. Oh, I think Garibaldi clown. Grimaldi, excuse me. Okay. I'm not trying to say nothing to sound just like some smart Negro on the internet. Look it up for yourself. Joseph Grimaldi, excuse me, is clown. So you get your modern image of clown from. These clown, do you see that theater once again? Theater coming into play. Theater is the learning center for the masses. Theater is the learning center for the masses of people. Start to see why Shakespeare and all those things are important. These have certain characters from the comedy Del Art and Drury Lane in England and whatever, not getting too crazy, but one in particular is 
<laughs> Harlequin. Harlequin. Harlequin is the clown and the jokester in a black mask. Tom, but they don't really want the truth. And a black mask. It's usually a servant sometime and does tricks to deal with the upper classes. Trickster. I'm just going to show you a little relation before we get back to Ethiopian, although this ties in. What I will do now is show you, you can, guys can Google Harlequin, matter of fact. Harlequin, as you can see, you can Google. Is the best known for, you know, the word zany? Well, it comes from Harlequin. There you go. Zany character comes from, what did I tell you? Comes from, come on. The comedy, the art. Did he lie about anything? No. Nothing. Hmm? So why is he talking about some zany and some Harlequin and all these things and trying to show clowns, trying to show you these characters he holds in his hand, by the way, this is what is called a slapstick. Anybody ever hear that word in comedy? Slapstick. The guy in the black mask, black face. <laughs> what you had in America, I'm just going to jump around just a little bit. Let's go back to our, like I say, the pieces will start coming together in a second. But if we put Harlequin in ye old Negro data, I need to just give this out to Negro America before I die so they can at least have this. This is 15,000 clippings of probably everything you want to know about as far as Negro them is concerned. Harlequin. Did I spell it wrong? Yes, I did. Harley Quinn. Oh, what do we have here in America, friends? Harlequin. Negro, did he find, you won't find this in nobody's books, none of them. I didn't read nobody's JSTOR or book for all this at all. This is coming from 2015. So this actually was from 1807, but it was clipped in 2015. Yesterday evening, the new Christmas Harlequinade of Harlequin Negro had a grand rehearsal at Drury Lane Theater. It displays some beautiful scenery and from its extreme drollery afford much amusement to the, a select number of spectators. There are two clowns, Laurent and Mouth, and the tricks and changes, very amusing. Hmm. Harlequin Negro, things are, might be heating up. What if we had Harlequin Jim Crow? Say like, what? As you can see, this evening we presented a new drama called The Duchess of De Valor Bob Bob Blair. Principal characters remembered by Messieurs Buckstone, Austin, blah 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 blah. Principal characters, da 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 da. Here we go. Harlequin Jim Crow. The most popular character in the world is Anne. Watch how we start to put together. Ethiopian named Jim Crow. Hmm. Who is Jim Crow? Well, we ain't talking Martin Luther King, although that's what Jim Crow comes from. My friends, this is an Ethiopian. Let me get the let me, let me just got the Wikipedia piece so I can blow it up for y'all. Named <laughs> that's Jim Crow. Now I'm gonna pause right here. Nobody listen. We done walk all the way from Italy and showed you the character, blah 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 blah. Now we are in America. This is what you're looking at. Once again, I'll put money on it. 
anyone wants to take the challenge, because I'm just talking. The first pop star in American history. I'll say it again so it can be recorded. This is Jim Crow, Daddy Rice, is the first pop star in American history. It is an Ethiopian, this is where it comes together, who were white men who put black makeup on their face, burnt cork, painted their lips red, and danced around like the Ethiopians. Who are the Ethiopians? Look at the first part of scientific racism. Didn't we read Blumenbach first? Let's go back. Let's go back just to jog our memory just a little bit. Blue Men Bach. Come on. Who are the Ethiopians? Once again, the Ethiopian race. Black is in a greater or lesser degree. Okay. With black frizzy hair, check. Thick lips, accentuated by the red. And flat nose, obviously they couldn't pull that off, but they made sure that they blackened it. Okay. Now, now you're going, why do you keep calling them Ethiopians, blah, blah, blah. I know the Negro mind very well. He's just trying to be all smart and connect stuff, right? It's only half true. So now, friends, let's go. I'm going to just type Ethiopian in here. How you want it? Barbecue or boogaloo? Ethiopians were the first performers that were performing in blackface. This is before anything called a minstrel comes around. Ethiopians performed and they are native to America. Although blackface to entertainment was in the music halls of Britain. Goes all the way back to the first white man putting black paint on his, paint on his face trying to be Othello. Goes back so it's not particularly an American creation. It is the uniqueness of what America did as far as how <laughs> it implemented this into popular culture and made it scientific fact. Yesterday, we talked about who has control of the Black body and the Black image because it's not Black people. These are the people that do these are the mechanisms of how, besides the institution of slavery that we know about, which was capturing of the physical body. But now the physical representation or definition also will emanate from the same people who have captured the body. Mm, mm, mm. You don't even own your own image. Think about it. The Ethiopians existed in this period around 1815 to approximately 1843 for those who like years. They come as first intermediaries or breakup acts within Shakespearean plays and other plays because they, the Ethiopian characters, appeased the masses. I'm going to go so the theater was the primary social institution. All classes of people are in there just to be seen. This is why the theater is broken up into different sections like that. And this is why the Pope folks sat up with the gods, some of y'all gonna get this now, which was the peanut gallery. It was called the lair or realm of the gods because the paintings on the ceilings were typically religious paintings. And by being so far up, you are closer to the ceiling amongst the gods. 
Mm. They were there not for the Shakespearean plays. Why? Because this is 1815. What is happening in America is America, the young country, is searching for its own identity. How so? Because this is now stamped in stone after something that we forget about in our books called the War of 1812. After that comes to its close, America is looking and rejecting the the implements or, or culture of the mother country or the old world and is looking to define itself. This is what's going on. So they're looking to themes that are native to the country that they have been in since 16 whatever as ways of defining themselves. They are in rejection of classical instruments. Let me just, and I, I give this to people today. When you think of classical culture, don't you realize that the populace isn't really into it? And what I mean by that, how many of y'all listen to classical music? Hmm? How many really go to the theater to see these highfalutin plays? That's not us. That is the rejection of Europe, these Americans, against Europe. So it never took hold because America at its foundation, 1815, as far as coming into making it come into its own, if you will, is looking to identify with themes out of here. So I'm not going to, it's really heavy and deep. This is where your ye omen and all of these crazy stories and river boatmen with, you know, Paul Bunyans and all those type of characters start to come out because those are American theme. But what is unique is the experience of who and what these Negroes are. Mm -hmm. They're presented to the world as the Ethiopians that the good old science people was talking about. And damn sure ain't Egyptians, why? Because the Egyptians are part of the Caucasian race as far as Blumenbach was concerned. Everybody else, like we read, was an Ethiopian. So within America and entertainment, you have the emergence of the Ethiopians and they this is where this is the science that you're not going to get nowhere else. And I might not even keep this video up. They twist Europe and its culture and create Ethiopian operas, which were comedic events making fun of black people. You don't know about it. Everybody going to some minstrel. This is way before the minstrel show. It's called the Ethiopian Opera. Burning up the Ethiopian Opera House. A fire this morning in Simmons and Slocum's Ethiopian Opera House destroyed the interior room. It's in Philadelphia. Right? Ethiopian oddities, your life is an oddity. Crystal Palace runs this in England. Newcomb's in England, because it got so popular in America, they take this Ethiopianism and spread it around the world so the world can understand how the Negro or Ethiopian in America is. This is how they learned who you are and how you acted. It was not from you. It was from the Ethiopians who were white men in black face, who performed in operas. You see it for yourself, I'm not making it up. Otherwise, laughable entertainment called the oleo of Ethiopian 
oddities. The program will com comprise most of their popular pieces, including the burlesque monster concert a la Mossad, the Black Carnival, concluding with the Plantation Medley song. I told you who they were presenting to the world. Who was on the plantations? And you were supposed to be happy slaves singing and dancing. Was that you telling the world? No, it was the Ethiopians. Do we see our scientific racism from the hallowed halls of Cambridge or whenever and its foolishness? That's not how the people got it. The people got it because the connection came between these Ethiopians. Oh, that's who Blumenbach is talking about when he says that stuff. So, <laughs> anybody getting this? That's what's going on. This is how the world knows about you. And these Ethiopians are performing in Ethiopian operas they become parts of circuses as solo acts it's the difference they're solo acts in this case what well let's go to is this barnum hey let's see what i don't know it's another one but we'll get the picture so we'll go to barnum this is 1844 we'll go to the museum actually barnum side note is the reason that the modern museum is the way it is that's another story so in the museum you have what is it? Or this extraordinary creature bears a closer resemblance to mankind than any other animal ever discovered. And so you have these creatures, but then you have at the bottom in this freak show, what do you go and see? An Ethiopian opera. Above it, you have lady minstrels and southern songsters will in introduce a variety of what? Negro extravaganzas. None of these people are of African descent. But the world, which is in a museum, is learning about who and what you are, not from you. Anybody see the science that is being implemented using popular culture as a weapon? So these Ethiopians sing the songs. I don't think people get this. That become the popular songs of America. They have something. I heard this word being used in Woketopia last year and now. Delineation. Well, guess what the Ethiopians were called? Ethiopian delineators. They were delineating the alleged ways, mores, characteristics of black folks. This is how the world learned who and what you were. And it's done through plays, popular culture, newspapers, popular culture, and song. Everybody still with me? People still with me? Yeah, I think so. So now that we have Jim Crow, who is the first rock star in America, and I told you Jim Crow has a song called Jim Crow. You guys can look it up, but he's an Ethiopian performer. It's not a minstrel. There's no minstrel show yet. I'm gonna show you the popularity of this. Where are my Southern folks at? Watch this. Through the magic of Negro vision, I'm gonna show you something right before your eyes because some of you may have even seen this before for this picture on the internet. Let's go to it. Let's go to it. Let's go open. Folks, 
Now you understand that, no, first of all, take your feelings out of this. This is not you. These are representations of white men in blackface acting like buffoons. I pause there, acting like buffoons. Now, watch this. Some of the people have laughed because I have said buffoons. And they'll be like, oh, see, you got to go to name calling. Not once have I gone to name calling. I have shown exactly where, as a matter of fact, let's stop talking. One of the biggest Ethiopians was a man named George Washington Tim Dixon. Remember the word I said? He has a Wikipedia page. So who is George Washington Dixon? I'm going to go, uh-oh, we see this right here. Why did he go there? There's another Ethiopian named Zip Coon. But let's go to, is it in here? No, it's not in that one. I'm going to type the word control F. Bui, B, Bui, B, what the hell is Bui? B, what? B, U, F, F, uh oh, F, O. Oh. When I say buffoons, what does it say he is? At this classic establishment, Mr. Dixon, the American Bufo singer, I pause there to go. Well, that's Bufo. That don't say buffoon. I know the Negro mind well. B-U-F-F-O. What is a Bufo? You know that. Remember Ethiopian, Italian operas and Ethiopian operas? Well, Bufo performed in comic operas in Italy. And this is where you get the term buffoon from. <laughs> Somebody listening, please let some young millennial or young, what's the next generation on that least go like, damn, I did learn out of school. He put something together. That's who I do it for. Old heads is stuck in their ways. They're going to think I'm just talking smack the whole time. I said they were buffoons. See where the terminology comes from? Slapstick, buffoons, extravaganza even. What is an extravaganza? Is this just someone who's in front No, we don't want to go. Right? We just want to go what? Extravaganza. They don't got to. Just give me extravaganza. Stop trying to be extravaganza. <sighs> extravaganza is a literary literary or musical work usually containing elements of burlesque pantomime music hall and parody those were negro extravaganzas and they were creating a spectacle what is a spectacle? In general, spectacle refers to an event that is memorable for the appearance it creates. You might follow along. This is an Ethiopian performer who is a buffoon walking around in burnt cork on his face delineating and creating a spectacle of himself mocking black people in America. I said, this is an Ethiopian. And I hop on that because as I now scroll up, did you ever notice that Dandy Jim from Caroline is a what? Do you understand why now it is an Ethiopian 
song. Never noticed that. So sure, some of you have seen this on the internet. Hmm? This guy, along with Daddy Rice and other performers, are Ethiopian performers. They performed in circuses, museums, and Ethiopian operas. They sang the songs that became the American classic songs. People still here, I'll give the bonus to this. Coppers, Queen, uh-oh, I got all the ladies in the house today. Shall I give the bonus, ladies? It's not even nine o'clock. Shall I do it? I said they gave the classic American song, Kaba, that you sing, we sing, they sing, everywhere sing them. You don't even know that you are singing Ethiopian songs. Hmm? Well, what do I mean? What does this Negro on the internet mean? Do you want this Jew? First off, y'all going around here, y'all done made all these people millionaires and they done scammed the hell out you. I'm going to go ahead and say, if you like what you've learned so far, you learn at least one new thing. And if you would like to support, the Cash App is HistoryMan718. The Cash App is HistoryMan718. I'll leave it at that. Or you can float. You're behind, back down the Nile River, and end up in Mesopotamia, whatever the hell you going, and have a good day, and I hope you learn at least one new thing for your travels. But those were the Ethiopians who were creating spectacles, and I told you they not just performed, they made the American songs. So much so, are y'all ready? Because this is a Jew that they're not going to get nowhere else. I need to check the chat again and see if they still with me. How can I get right? Oh, Lord, I got rid of the comments. Hmm? That's why they tied Virginia and Egypt together? Huh? I don't, I don't necessarily know. I don't. So, what it is, watch this in Tavo. I'm going to give them the jewel of all Jews. Not all of all Jews, just one of the many. I'm like truth the jeweler around here. <laughs> so what happens is this, folks. This is something you're going to take with you, and I hope you really do take it with you. The father of American music is, was, and E C O P. I'm gonna let that rest for all the haters get a time to digest it. Here he go again with his old exaggerations. I said the father of American music and the first professional songwriter in. American history was an Ethiopian. I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to do my Umar Johnson and, and say this one more time before we get into it. The father of American music, take this and write it down verbatim. I'm not running from one word I say. The father of American music was an Ethiopian. He is also the first professional songwriter in American history. We never learned that. 
you sing the songs. Now, let's get into it. His name, folks, you're welcome, is Stephen Foster. Let's read this. Stephen Foster, Kaba, word for word of what I just said, known as the father of American music, was an American composer and songwriter known primarily for his parlor and minstrel music during the Romantic period. I said you knew the songs. He wrote more than 200 songs, including Oh Susanna, Hard Times Come Again No More, Camp Town Races, Old Folks at Home, which is Swanee River, my old Kentucky home. Hmm. I'm sure you sang some of those. Hmm. An Ethiopian. <laughs> okay, man. Go slow with them. Go slow with them. Foster grew up in a section of the city with many European immigrants. I told you this is how immigrants, Irish and otherwise, learn about you, who you were, and how to treat you. Was it from you? No, it was from the Ethiopians. Had settled and were accustomed to hearing the music of the Italian, Scots, Irish, and German residents. He composed his first song, yada, yada, yada. As you can see, popular songs, Foster's lyrics have been altered by publishers and performers. Ray Charles released a version of Old Folks at Home that was titled Swanee River Rock, which became his first pop hit. Ray Charles' first pop hit was a remake of an Ethiopian's song. Did I make that up? By the way, the Ethiopian, the father of American music, the first professional songwriter, also Great America, has his songs as state songs. My Old Kentucky Home is the official state song of Kentucky. Do you understand how popular culture is a weapon and we have no idea a state song? There were multiple. In America is from an Ethiopian who was delineating an enslaved black person longing for his plantation back home. My God. Anybody here? All of them take me home songs that you think are country songs, my people, are actually Ethiopian songs. And the character who's singing it is a Negro who wants to go back to his plantation, whether it's Kentucky or Dixie. Old Folks at Home became the official state song of Florida. That's number two. The father of American music has a statue. Would you like your stomach to turn before breakfast? There's a memorial at Pittsburgh. Where's the thing? They ain't got the, the statue. Uh-oh. I'll just go to Wikipedia, God damn. Stephen Foster statue. Well, if you go to Stephen Foster sculpture, Stephen Foster sculpture, geez, you will see that sitting at his feet is who? A banjo playing Negro. Did you know that? Let's go to Wikipedia so we can blow this up. Did you know that? Well, looky here. Hmm? Hmm? 
popular culture is a weapon. We getting played right and left and don't even know the history. The father of American music sitting down writing. And who is he getting it from? The Negro that he is then twisting these things and creating the Ethiopian <laughs> that the world, they didn't get it from old Hambone himself, him doing that because he's getting through his suffering and trying to get some joy out of a messed up situation. No, they got it from the Ethiopians who got you singing Jimmy Crack Corn and old Susanna. Susanna, did you know, was a black-eyed woman? Mm, 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 mm. Let's do that. Let's see if we can find... Let's just go to old Susanna. You ever do this? Click on images and then go, where is it? Well, then, truth, you say. Well, then that explains how... Come on now. When you see the song sheet for O Susanna, well, looky here, who is on the song sheet cover? O Susanna, as you can see, is also a what? Favorite Negro melody. Not because you sang it, because they were in their character of Ethiopians who were the, the Negroes. Mm, mm, mm. Did you know that? Let me just pause for a second. I might be just going to. I might be going overkill. Let me just stop sharing. Stop sharing. Anybody with me? Anybody with me? Old Black Joe as well, James. That's right. I can I can name them all. Do you be you want to throw out everything you ever sang in camp or taught to your children? Anybody? with me any exaggerations when i use words like ethiopians and extravaganzas and spectacles or whatever and buffoons am i just trying to use colorful speech hmm am i just trying to use colorful speech to impress negro america no 90 percent of what just happened you can Google for yourself. Hopefully you were playing along to see. Was no sleight of hand. Was no trying to interpolate words to satisfy the Woktopian mind. Straight facts. All before 9 a.m., mind you. Now, may I take three seconds to light my breakfast? Thank you. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. Here you go. Hmm? Right, Kaba. We all sang these songs. Black folks sang these songs, too. Ray Charles' first hit was this. It was so ingrained in our culture by that point, we won't be able to figure it out. That's the thing. People won't be able to figure this out. It is too ingrained in our culture. Hmm? So what I'm going to do is, if they're good questions, I'll answer them. I got a little bit of time. I got some work to do today. and I'm talking all this stuff. I'm taking my black behind right in the Yasser boss's office tomorrow and be the first one there probably. I ain't Kanye, goddammit. You take my bread, it hurt. But what I'll do is I will I will put the thing, put the thing, put the link in the chat if people are interested and maybe have a question that I could answer. If I can't answer, I have no problem telling you I don't know. Um, and let me just say thank you before. Yeah, I'm late for church, Ogun. You ain't lying. I'm gonna say thank you. I don't want to. I never want to.
be, what is it, unmindful or ungrateful. Vyasa, Craig, um, Monwell, and Anthony Smith. Smith, thank you. I, I do see, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That's going to a much bigger project that I wasn't even supposed to come back just yet, but I figured if the hoodie actually hit me up, I was like, God damn, something must be going on in Wotopia. Time to at least say something. So if you'd like to join, there's the link. Um, if there's a few relevant questions, uh, you're welcome. Um, if you guys knew everything already, then, you know, hey, sorry. But if you didn't, seriously, and if, if there's a question or something I can clear up or you want more information on, this is the time that I sent a question. What is it? Question, question. See, peace, uh, Kiawa, Kiawa and and Sabio and Easy and Gala. Is there any questions? Then this thing. Uh, uh, I saw Queen Cheetah in here and Marquise and Divine Seven, of course, and Easy, my main man. Is there any questions? What's the matter? Nobody want to. It's okay. I ain't. I, you can ask a question. Did the Lost Cause Confederacy get the rebel yell from Hall calling? Mm, damn, James, it's a great question. <sighs> that rebel yell does come from some type of this, George Macon, does come from some type of uh, a calling. I don't know necessarily. I don't want to just say it. That makes sense to me that it would come from that. I could I could go and dig in the files to give validity to that. But that makes sense to me. Um, go ahead, George. You, you, do I got to unmute you? Go ahead, man. What's up, man? Hey, then yeah, I'm gonna uh, email you. You still got the okay. same email address, right? Yeah, yeah, I still got the same email. I think you said that. Yeah, I just didn't check mine. I'll check. Yeah, it. I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna send you a cash app. I want. Uh, right. I'm gonna send you my sure. number. I, I want to get some more information on that Mordecai Noah because I want to do a stream and tie that in. <laughs> I, I want to tie that. I want to tie that into all the stuff I was doing about the Jewish music execs. Like what you brought out was 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 crazy, and it's funny because. A lot of these, a lot of these so-called black historians that that know history, some of them know this history, but they're not going to do it the way you do it because you follow the timeline to really incriminate them where they can't use anti-Semitism, because nobody, nobody, like nobody really black that's not really into the history. They don't know who that dude is. They don't know that he was the one leading the minstrel shows. It was actually a Jewish person. They don't right. know this stuff. So the the importance of him. All right. So maybe I go into that scene. I, and I appreciate all the people who uh, who watched yesterday or shared the video. I'm not one of the people who take things like that for granted. I, you know, granted the video only got what, 500 views or whatever. But for people to share that and just get some messages saying that they really appreciated that or took some from it. I, you know, I, I thank them for that. And um, I don't ever want to be unmindful of things like that from people who take their time and just listen to, you know, they could be doing anything or listening to anything on YouTube. So I just want to say that. But at the same time, I see I may have <laughs> opened up a can of worms because like I was trying to just uh, say the story, you have to slow down with it and actually learn the history before George, like I say, we put on that black power glove, punch the glass, but we end up jumping out the damn window, right? Because then you go, oh, look what the Jews are doing. There is reasons and history behind all of it. And we have to be able to understand where we are first to understand our footing. This is why for so many years, the emphasis was on just on free black people, what they were doing, what they were building, whether it be here on Philly or wherever it is to get a foundation. So you don't come into something completely defensive. You know what you were doing and now you understand what they were up against. So if it was just a matter of us being up against something, we wouldn't have any idea, what was I doing? Well, now you know. Now you can say Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, this organization, that organization, this black town, that black town, this vigilance committee, this black college, doing all these things, and then this is what they're up against. Hey, can I, and I, because I, 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 I've seen the brother say the ADL doesn't care. I agree with you, but see, the, this is the thing what I've noticed. A lot of our people, we, like you said, we fight with it emotionally. 
And they come on and say, well, you hurt so many people with your words. Well, you don't see our black historians like they would have did in the 60s, really breaking it down the way you did. You actually show you actually show um, who was the father of the menstrual shows. You actually well, show. But that's what I want to say. So because I want to put this there. All right. Fine. I got a few minutes today. Fine. Fine. So I'll pick up where we left off yesterday, guys. God darn it. So Mordecai Noah is important because of what is going on in the time. So I'll back up for people who may. I'm sorry, because now when I go live, of course, people who know me, there's always going to be this is the Illuminati part. Always be something. So now they want to. Uh, so every time I go live, why do they want to mow the grass and everything? You really think I lived in like the botanical gardens or something like that. What the hell are they blowing the leaves? But. Is my screen sharing? Let me share my screen real quick. And I appreciate that, Afrocon. And all, all the people are down. There was people who, who donated, uh, who gave super chats yesterday. My apologies that I didn't see until I watched the replay. Please, please know that I did not neglect it. I just wasn't looking at the the, the thing to see it. So I, I, I want to say thank you to all those people who gave super chats yesterday. My bad. That's... Ogun was supposed to keep me on track about stuff like that, so I partially blame him. But he did tell me later, so I remember. But let me go back to just to to to, to do this because this might get our conversation. This ties into what we did today. It's not far off because the influence of what Mordecai Noah did led to the popularity of the Ethiopian. Let me show you the connection to that. So let me present. Uh, chair screen. Uh, come on now, we've been doing good. Like I say, part of the background noise, just pretend we're talking at the, at hey, the real quick, Danny. Be before you go, yeah, really go hard. Yeah. Go the, the reason why this is important, right? They're making mockery of that that video that that the Hebrew Israelite did from Negroes to uh, niggas, right? This mm -hmm. is the thing, though. That that that's one part of history. The way you broke this down. It can't be refuted because what you actually did was show an immigrant come to America and he was treated like a nigga. So he ended up hating niggas and creating this so called. No, 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 no. Uh -uh, uh -uh. He's born here. That's okay, the thing. yeah. So oh, here yeah, we go. he was a, he was a son of he was a son of immigrants, right? Yeah, he's a son of immigrants. So, right. so that, that's the thing. What I want people to, this is why I kind of gave it to today. You have 1815 come about, right? 1815 is significant because this is when a young America is trying to establish itself. Why? Because they have broken away from mama at this point. So they're looking for uniqueness and identity for this thing called America and in popular culture and its various mechanisms. You want to push away. That's why there's a rejection of, and we have it to this day, of what you call classical culture. Classical arts all come from Europe, do they not? The Boston Pops, the 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 the, the Kimmel Center stuff and all that other stuff, we don't go to that. And white folks don't. Really. The Irish people in, in South Philly ain't going to the Kimmel Center to see uh, the, the ballet. They're going to what is going on in their little regions. That's American popular culture to them. Some form of Irish this. So, you know what I'm saying? American themed as opposed to European themed. That starts at that point. There was a rejection of that. So then you want to go to what uniqueness is. What was unique, although there is enslavement in various places, is how Americans and the folks on this side manipulated and treated this institution of slavery. And the people that were emerging that were nowhere in history before, because there were people that were extracted from one place, put in this new world, and now are in the midst of, this is the key, forming something unique. And that became surveillance for them. And Mordecai Noah is jealous because we have to understand that he's a playwright himself. He is a failed playwright and nobody wants to go see his works. The African Grove Theater comes out and starts attracting white folks. It goes deeper than that. And I got a little bit of time and fine, I'll go slow. But here, here you go, folks. This is something that people may laugh. They go, this is something that's, PhD level 
type stuff that I'm going to try to break down as digestible as possible. And this is not just a talk or whatever. It is. Like I say, this is multi-layered. But what happens is, is these come from things called travel logs. Travel logs date all the way back to when Greeks and Romans are going on, on, on their jaunts and expeditions or what have you. But travel logs are important because it gives the masses of people when you return home an idea about these places and those tales and those ideas become part of popular culture. We know about Marco Polo because when he came back, these tales and these stories and things that he brought back with him, of course, open up people to the culture and to what was going on. Everybody, there was no jet blue and everybody wasn't getting on a boat to go and go and see what was going on and whatever. So people had to create this type of media in order to let people know what is going on. Well, guess what happens once America and the Caribbean, some of these places start to gain their independence? Well, the people of Europe want to know, well, what the heck is this America thing? Right? This is 1815. This is even in the 17, right? 1780s, whatever, right before, you know, we kick uh, Britain out of the country. There was this curiosity, well, what is this Creole person over there? This quote unquote American, not Creole as in black, Creole is born outside of the mother country, in this case, England. Well, what the heck is that? Right? So these things are, are, are starting to be questioned and America is searching for identity. Their uniqueness, which is truly American, is the American Negro. This is the fact. What is the music of America? It's the, the, the organic, authentic outside of this Ethiopian stuff is the music of black folks. This, now, and I, this is America. I don't mean that the Native Americans before America was America didn't have their music. Of course there was music. I'm talking about this thing we call America. The song and the music of it is the music of black people. The most rooted thing, we are created, created here. <laughs> There's no more rooted than that. But this is the root that they can't pull out. This is the root also we run from, but hey, that's another story. But my point is, now we're talking about these folks, and you have all these folks. I tried to point out, 1787, Free African Society, and Prince Hall, and schools. and this, Don't you think that that is the biggest threat to them? Well, wait a minute. Now we got another dynamic where we're not only dealing with these Africans over here, or these black Negroes on these slaves, but now we got some free ones. George Macon, you are in the heart of it. Can you imagine how they was feeling walking around 6th Street or anywhere else when this is going on? And like I say, we don't understand... If it was the case where we was all African, we would have ran to the damn Liberia ships. So I say, and they got people telling you the only way you are going to be accepted as equal is if you get your behind on a boat to Africa. And these folks around Woketopia, oh, they wanted to be African. No, they knew they were Africans. They just wasn't going back to no Africa because they ain't never been to no Africa. They've been living in Philadelphia for two generations. We confusing it like they didn't know they was African. They clearly knew they was African. Negro, I got a church. I got a business. Now I got some Mason stuff going on down the street. What am I going to the jungle for? Hmm? Because they're telling you that's the only way you're going to make this work. Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, Peter Williams, uh, Charlotte Fortin, whoever you want to name. You don't know what they was up against. And these Woketopians play games. They were up against face-to-face -face and eye-to-eye -eye with this. So in the midst of that, I'm going to make this all connect. It's not a rant. In a second, Mordecai Noah is doing these things. I'm trying to show people the importance of the arts that was like watching TV. That was also the social gathering places, also the places where people learned. 
He is feeling threats because the free black people in this instance of New York are establishing things without them. This is called independence. This poses a threat. They don't run from this. They tell you this. That was the threat. And we take, oh, these are Uncle Tom's. And that's where they was free. Like that was the Denmark, Vesey, and Nat Turner were free people. David Walker was free. Those were the biggest threats because they have the audacity to try to establish something that we all take for granted called today the black community. We just act like this shit was just happenstance. People had a concerted decision to make this thing happen. These are the people trying to disrupt it. So when we go to Mordecai Noah, I mean, do I, which way do I, I mean, I could take you in various number of ways. That means what do I, I'm sure I got his stuff from his time. So you'll see it. Noah. Here we go. Well, here you go. That's 9,000. Mordecai Noah. Let's get one closer to his times. Here you go. I got it down to where he was living in 1802. Guess who's a nut job about this? He was living at number two. Matter of fact, it's in Philly. Number two, North, North Second? There you go. Anyway, we could geek out on that. Yeah, he was living in Philly because that's going to be important. Don't forget, we got Ethiopians. Don't think I'm that lit while I got off. Of I know where I'm going with this. So, but you see Mordecai Noah going through. Here you go. He is the sheriff, George. So now you're dealing with the dude who owns the newspaper. He's also the sheriff, as you can see, when we scroll down to sheriff, Mordecai Noah. The most powerful Jewish person in America at the time, I didn't say it, we read it yesterday, is also the same person who set up this surveillance of black folks. Here's the tie-in, George. This is why I tried to give it to people slow. Mordecai Noah was down with what the ACS was doing. This is where popular culture becomes weaponized because all of this stuff, menstrual Ethiopian otherwise, was the attempt to downgrade you so much that you would get on the boats and go to Liberia. If anybody now wants to take two steps back and see the time period that all of this is happening and see that these are the people that they're telling you, you may be free and you will never be equal. They're trying to ridicule and downplay them so that the rest of the country hates them. So they get on a boat and go to Liberia. Mordecai Noah is part of that colonization so that's basically what basically what you said in a nutshell was then he was able to regardless whether he was a Jew or not he was able to hide behind his whiteness we wasn't able to hide behind nothing so the only thing the thing about black folks and all this and all through popular culture and everything is is where now I'm not one of the people who don't try to get the whole truth they barbecue Irish people Chinese people uh, Jewish people Polish people Italian people everybody got their barbecue the thing about the Negro was we are the only ones, I need people to listen carefully, who don't have any redeeming qualities. Exactly. The Irish man, although a drunk and goes through mobocracy, sticks together and will take care, you know, the South Philly tough Irish, and that, that's something, right? So they then, you know, gather around. The German man, although a bit dull, he works hard, right? German, Dutch, and all those became like Dutch Schultz. That was a slight, slight toward him. He just internalized it. But that G German thing and Polish thing was kind of dumb. The Jew was always weird or whatever, but they were good with the numbers and all this other stuff, right? The Italian, it was a while before they gave him some redeeming qualities. But once he started dropping the vowels a little bit, then he, he got some cleanup. 
the China man, he ain't going to bother nobody. He's just going to have his laundry mask and eat his chow mein that we love so much. Right? So it, 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 the, when it came to us, our redeeming quality was singing and dancing. Cold hard facts. You had no other real redeeming quality outside of being entertainment for them. These are all facts. So Mordecai Noah, though, he has this power. Here's the connections, George. This is how people see I'm not as lit as they think. The next one, watch folks who've been watching since the beginning. Mordecai Noah has a homeboy who's in, watch the connection to George, Philadelphia. His name is, ah, oh, I already got it in here for you and took my old search. E.W. Clay. Here's another name for you folks. They still listening? Edward Williams Clay in Philadelphia, George. The day I moved to Philadelphia, I went to the library company and I went in there, right? And I go and I'm talking to the people. I know exactly what I'm looking for. And I'm like, I'm looking for the stuff by Clay or whatever. Oh, how do you know about that or whatever? I'm looking for these specific pictures, or whatever. George, they took me up to, it's a second floor up there in the back. And they got some old, those cabinets that you pull all the way out, son, and sat me there. I got every one of them images that's in that library company by Edward W. Clay. And I'm going to show you why. Edward W. Clay is a homeboy of or a contemporary of Mordecai Noah. Edward W. Clay is influenced by the writings of Noah and Noah to now give visual representation. Remember yesterday I said Mordecai is for the African amusements is the words. There's no visuals just yet for the people to digest. But now we know how they speak. So coming to the stage is who they are. Edward W. Clay. By the way, folks, where were those free black populations that I've been talking about so many years? Would people say Philadelphia? Would people say New York? Okay. So was an American artist, illustrator, and where's Seneb? Political cartoonist. He created the notoriously racist collection of lithograph titled Life in Philadelphia. Guess who he was notoriously racializing? People like the names I've been mentioning all these years. You don't know what those people were up against. So Edward W. Clay has this life in Philadelphia. You guys can click on it. Yeah. You'll see that there, and I have every one of these pictures. They are all in the library company. Got every one. You want to see them? You've seen this before. Making fun of our fraternal orders. There you go. That's Edward W. Clay. Mm-hmm. Making fun of our abolition uh, meetings that we're having. Making fun of us as free people. This is the surveillance that I talk about that is part of popular culture, culture cops in first 48. It's the surveillance and look at these oddities. Oddities. We are viewed as oddities. Our life is entertainment. This is called life in Philadelphia. Edward, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Okay. okay. Watch the connection now. Now, we was talking about Ethiopians. You can read all of this. is where the black speech and malapropisms and all that comes from. Folks, watch the cash out for this one. Because when it all comes, this is the clicker right here. Then you can go, George. The cash app is History Man 718. If you learn just one new thing, I ain't saying it no more. There you go. Edward W. Clay is contemporaries of Mordecai Noah. We was talking about Ethiopians, though. Jim Crow. Image. You can do this at home. Let's go to... I'm going to give you the full one. You can do this at home, folks. You're going to see, like... I'm like, I don't even want to say Houdini, whatever, with this, but watch, watch this, George. I need to get the right one. Just bear with me. Watch me do it this way to give it a, to give it away for you. Jim Crow, E.W. Clay. 
Now that I have the right one, you will see that folks, watch George, the person who did this picture is Edward W. Clay, also member of the American Colonization Society. Right back to the Ethiopians that I was talking about. Get it? That's who did this. E.W. Clay. What? I know y'all lit like, what? So when you go back here and you see, I'm not making it up. You guys can do this at home. You know I ain't making it up. So I'm showing you how to get to it. Huh? Hmm. Kawinky Dink? No. It's a concerted effort to weaponize popular culture so people can learn about who these people are, not from themselves, but through popular culture. And that is how it has always been. They know of you through MTV or through the videos or through the newscast. That is an acceptable way of learning who you are. So if those images are weaponized in a certain way, this is how the masses or the populace learn about you. You don't have no control over that. Go ahead, George. It's it's crazy. Like oh, all all throughout the years when you when y'all uh, is breaking this stuff down and teaching it, um, what you just showed with the uh, the ACS. They teach it as if they was our allies and trying to help us where this dude was on the board. They wasn't our allies. They was trying to get us the hell out of here. Like a lot right. of times the way I heard the history, uh, man, they was, you know, they, they were uh, good people uh, separate from the racist whites. But then this is the question that I have because you're just one man. You, uh, Tahuti Ma'at, Seneb, you know, for years y'all been on here teaching it, and it never really broke through the algorithm. But I know why. It's for a reason. A lot of these so-called black educators, big the ones that we know, like Skip Gates ain't going to never teach this history because what happens is, to me, what you just broke down, going way back to the 1800s not and, and actually bringing the timeline up to now, that's something that's irrefutable that they can't call anti-Semitism because it's history. You can't lie on history. The reason why I'm, I'm saying that because those educators that's black, they're not going to do that. They're going to start right from the civil rights era. And they're going to say, talk about our friendship and our bondship. But they're not going to break down where our, our consciousness and thought process, the way we view ourselves, come from. What you just yeah. did was go back where they would have they would really have to answer questions because it's a historical fact. And did they, yeah, they I, agree. I just want to say, I just caught a comment. Hey, why not learn? I wasn't trying to oversimplify anything about the Chinese people. I just wasn't trying to, that's not the particular emphasis. Like, I mean, of course, just influence from China and I got a whole portfolio of uh, political advertisement where they got the Chinese people eating the rats and the whole bit. Like I was, I said on, um, let me just go because it's in the same vein. But but see, no, but see, Danny, that that's a distraction because that that person is watching it. They're intelligent. That the gist wasn't about Chinese people. You gave reference. You gave reference to every group, not just Chinese people. You actually said something about the Italian. They know exactly what you're talking about. That's just to take us off course. Like that person watching. Like, come on, man. The, 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 he's given he's given the example of what happened to the Negro people, but he showed reference to what happened to every group. So. Like, right, I mean, that's, that's, that's all I was trying to do. Not, I could do. I mean, shit, I could spend the next two hours talking about how they did it to the Chinese. Yeah, but I we mean, don't need. To, we ain't Chinese. <laughs> we ain't telling them to go watch <laughs> Chinese people. We ain't Chinese. We talking about what they did to our people. He said nothing bad about Chinese. He, he basically said they was cool as long as they was eating their Chinese food and didn't bother nobody. That's that's what the reference was saying because they we know they they, they uh 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 went through dis discrimination, but the key Ooh, part that person. The key part this, that person missed miss was what you said was what you said was we had no redeeming. We 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 had nothing that was redeeming us. Every other group did. Yes. Here you go. Thank you, Black. That's the type of stuff I'm looking for, Black. 
So Black says, how did it get to the point where these become household songs after starting off as teachings for immigrants and as weapons against Black people? Is this where Free Black started doing menstrual? So this is a little bit, because we're going a little bit. All right, so let me break this down. These became household songs because from the beginning, this is American popular music. Ethiopians were, okay. Songs became, <laughs> y'all really want it? Because the terminology, y'all gonna think I'm bugging and making it up. It sounds like a rap song. And I'm glad you asked this, Black, because I'll give this part out of it so people can understand the terms. When I say things like the plug and hustlers and all this stuff and the syndicate and all these no, things. You did this before. I know where you're going. I'm listening. You did this Now before. I'm going to take it even further back. My friends, and y'all are, are going to do this with me because then y'all not going to say, oh, there he go, making up some stuff again. Right? So it starts with present, share screen. Share screen was the five files. So watch the terminology. Your man is nice with this time. Watch. So it starts with this. Who was that? Black, I think. I want you to go to Wikipedia once again. See how they always know Wikipedia. I ain't got to go nowhere but Wikipedia. There you go. Watch the terminology, my head poppers. Go to street literature. Street literature, hmm? You will learn that street literature is not something, it's probably the name of my new rap album if y'all don't steal it, but <laughs> street literature is any of several different types of publications sold on the streets at fairs and other public gatherings by traveling hawkers, peddlers, or chapmen from the 15th to the 19th centuries. Robert Collison and Council of the Service describes street literature as the forerunner of the popular press. The hotter things become hot was in the streets. Well, who was giving out these broadside ballots? It was people who were called song mongers. What? Yes, the song mongers or ballad mongers were hustling street literature, hawking them and peddling them of these incidents that may in some cases been historical events or songs. Okay. And so when it came to song in particular, these hawkers with their street literature were also performing on the street, as I said, and I tried to emphasize a number of times because this is a distinction, Ethiopians are solo acts. When they band together, they become minstrels in the minstrel show. That creation is later, is what I'm really trying to get across to people, this whole other eras before that, the menstrual show is America's, I will put the money up again on this, America's first native popular entertainment. Somebody put the wages up so I can win me some money on a Sunday. The menstrual show is America's first native popular entertainment. It is for Ethiopians in a semicircle performing and doing a show is what the menstrual show is. But prior to that, Black, how the songs got hot was Ethiopians were solo acts standing on streets and what have you hawking their vulgar songs and music to people also singing them. This is how music got passed around. It was through singing. And then these Ethiopians, like I mentioned, also performed in bars, saloons at the time, and in circuses. Circus, 
my wife, my wife uh, asked because she asked us yesterday too when we was listening. She said, yeah. "Why, why did they call it Minstrel Show?" Because you, know, you don't want to hear that. You, right. So what I would do is, and I'll, I'll only tell it because it, the question came from a woman, a woman and, I, and I will do it. Normally, I tell people, this is the, like, I don't gave a lot of Jews. Do you really want to know? Do my people really want to know? I'm probably going to black out and just go dark. What is it? <laughs> go off the pile for another six months after I say all this stuff. So I'm going to give you this part. So sister and friends, that's the question. Great questions. I ain't forget you, Black. Why did they call it a menstrual? Do you guys really want to know? Can I get a yes or a no? The sister does. Yes. I need to do that. Listen, it's Sunday. I'm going to, like I say, I'm going to be going back in the clouds after this anyway. But thank God somebody finally asked me the Damn simplest of questions. Because that, see, sister, George's wife, thank you for everything you do for George and the family, whatever. People, Negroes, get too smart for their own damn good, thinking they even, oh, that's the menstrual, menstrual. Nobody goes, well, where did they get the menstrual from then? You just automatically assume and mean white person in blackface, don't you? Well, Thank God for the black woman sometime. Menstrual, go back to Wikipedia, don't got nothing to do with you yet. Menstrual means traveling performer. These are the other people going back to performing these things like comedy, Dell art, or whatever, to Italy or whatever, but traveling performers. How did it get to the Negro? I won't go far from that. Y'all going to see today. Damn, she don't ask the right question. Finally, somebody has asked it. Well, in America, there was something going on where somebody was going on tour. I'm sharing my screen. Yes, I am. And who? Remember. Let's go to the number. 15,407. I can almost guarantee if it got something to do with the melanated Negro. So I'm going to go, sister, and tell you, and you can share it with the rest of these people. They got it from because there was some yodelers. Watch how the story gets twisted because I can only do this in my way because it's fact-based. There was some yodelers who were going around the country at the time around 1830s, going into the 40s, who were popular. They were called, guess who got the primaries? The Tyrolese Minstrels. For, since this is a family, make sure your wife see this. Tyrol, well, what year is this? 18. 32. The menstrual show does not happen to 1843. Hmm. These folks were going around and they were from Tyrol and they were yodelers. Yodeling. They were them. These people came to America. When did they come to America? Once again, off the dome from the database. They came to America when? 1842. When did the menstrual show start? 1843. Well, looky here. In 1842, their name are the Rainers. These popular vocalists, the Rainers, Sing this evening at the rooms of the Society Library. These minstrels of the Tyrol with the beautiful melodies of their native Alpine valleys attract large audiences. I got to plug this in. Did y'all get that? Did anybody get that? Did anybody get that? The cash app is History Man 718 If you learn something that you ain't never heard before. Let me make sure they're still with me. Hold on now. 
I plugged it in. We still good? Are they still with me? Are they still with me? Yes? No? Maybe so? Kamba, put a one. Am I still on? Huh? Huh? Oh, Goon, am I still on? Because it's about it's about to get crazy. Like they gotta ask the right questions and they get the right answer. Huh? One? Can I get one? I just want to make sure my screen. There we go, Bibio. So, like I would say, Bibio, you like this one, right? They were called, named the type. Let's go to the Rainers. Is he making this up? When they ask the right questions, they'll get the right answers. To who? Nobody asked the simplest questions. Well, why was they mystery? You keep calling them Ethiopians. Well, this is where they got the mystery part from. Uh, Minstrels. I got their record company, record company, their album somewhere. Well, look at here. Let's just go to the website. Here they are in color. This is before the minstrel show. You got people going around. Are they making fun of black people? No, because minstrel means what? Traveling performer and acrobat and all that stuff. <laughs> they ain't making fun of no black folks. They up there yodeling, doing silent night. Hmm? The Tyrolese menstrual. So what happens when we go back to Negro Central, we see in 1842, these vocalists are where students, and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way, like a funny way. We're just joking so nobody get all in their feelings. Yes, they are in New York City. Well, where is the first menstrual show? That's right. New York City. Well, when did that happen? We'll get to that in a second. So we see this popularity of them yesterday. Did I establish that? Are these Tyrolese menstrual people popular? Yes? No? Oh, no? No? Not good enough? Hello, Bueller? This thing on? At night, I can't sleep. Um, so we see them in New York. We also see the New York... In 1843, the Rainers or Tyrolese minstrels have the honor to announce to their friends in the public in general that they have returned from where? The South. All you got to do is ask the right questions. The hoodie, the thing is, will they put all the pieces back together? That's the thing. And will give one grand vocal concert at the Society Library on Friday, June 9th. Okay, so now we got Tyrolese performers. They still with me? Yes, they are. We got Tyrolese performers. So now, what happens when four Ethiopians, out of work carpenters and Irish, these are Irishmen, and English, half English and Irishmen, who ain't got nothing going on and is carpenters and working down in the levees of Mississippi, Louisiana, and whatever, these or what the boatmen, all those black enslaved and folks stealing and interpolating their culture. This is where they get the roots from. Go down to New Orleans or whatever, and they're taking it from the black street performers over there. Yes, they take it and pervert it. Who's now now to mention levee again and all those places, you understand? So, yes, there is black rooted in this, but it's a twisting of it way early. But they try to make it seem like they the authentic us. This is why they use the instruments of the enslaved. The jawbone, because they ban the drum, remember, so we can't have percussive. So we start hand boning and using the jawbone, which is the jaw of animals. As well as you see the banjo and the banjar is there as well.
I'm not even in the chat. I was talking to myself. Am I back? Can I be heard? My bad, y'all. I thought I plugged it in and I didn't. Don't blame me. Blame the man. Am I here? Can I be heard? Hello? Let me type this in the chat. Hello? Got too big for my britches. I know. It be happening. Can I be heard? Okay, thanks. My bad, y'all. Well, I got I got a little seat. That's what they call. I, I got up, up out of my station. I thought I was better than I was. I got too uppity. That's that's them people putting me back in my place. There he go getting uppity. My bad, Richard. Richard. My bad. Good to see you, Rich. I, I got too uppity and they had to put me back in my place. <laughs> them people said, all right now, enough. Enough with your bufos and your extra we we see you. So, <laughs> all right, but let's get back to, I think, oh, I was talking, you asked about the menstruals, which I thought was finally somebody asked the dope question. So people understand it came from them, but I'm not, I'm a sort of connection to how did it, how it then gets to um, stay up with right on, Robert, how it gets to it. Am I sharing? Yeah. So these Tyrolese minstrels come around, and like I say, they're in all the major cities going to perform. So what happens is, this is the, you understand, let's just get to it, Virginia minstrels. So what happens is, here's the first minstrel show, my friends. The first, the first, brought to you by yours truly, if it was in the book, you guys would be like, oh, look what they show. You get it for free by having your melanin levels aggregated. I don't know if I use aggregated right, but I'll just go with it. This, friends, is the, the advertisement for the first menstrual show. This is February 8th, 1843. The Bowery Amphitheater, one week longer. See? Previous to the departure of the company to fulfill their engagement at the Tremont Theater. Matter of fact, I got one that's prior to this because it was February. This is the second one, I think. Yeah, this is the second one. I'll show you the first one. But so they're going on where? To fulfill their obligation at the Tremont Theater in Boston. They're in New York. Now they're going to spread it to Boston. The managers of the New York Bowery Amphitheater Company have the honor of announcing to the public that they have concluded an engagement with the lessee of the Tremont Theater in Boston to commence their performance at the beautiful and fashionable establishment on the 20th instant. In consequence of which they are happy to state that they will be enabled to delay their departure from this city. This is them amping it up. So like, yo, y'all can still come see and perform for one week longer during which time the following brilliant attractions will be offered. Monday, February 6th, first night of the first night, first night, Monday evening, February 6, 1843, first night of the novel Grotesque. This is how you come on the scene. The, um, the menstrual show is the first native popular entertainment in America. This is how you come to the stage. You don't have no control over how the populace views and treats you. You are the Ethiopians, those who were here earlier. Remember where that come from? That came from the sciences. We looked at Blumenbach. We saw Ethiopian was the race, and that was everybody in Africa who was what? Who was not Egyptian. North African. So then Ethiopian becomes a what? You have to think of the psyche of the people. It's relational to the Bible. It's relational to this. And it gives these slaves or people here some ex exoticness, one, and they can put you in this whole evolutionary human chart. So instead of just calling your negros and such to make themselves who I am the authentic melanated one, this is why they chose Ethiopian. And they were going to present to the world the true characteristics of these people through 
song and dance. How did they become popular? And in the households, street literature in the form of ballot monger humans, ballot monger hawking their goods in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Charleston, uh, Virginia, down in Louisiana. It's not just a northern thing by any means. Hmm? Hawking those goods, singing those songs where at the levees and the saloons, I was saying, oh, yeah, in the museums, which are located in the same area. P.T. Barnum, the father of American show business, had Ethiopian performers in his American museum since we here and we it's not even 10 y'all lucky y'all called me earlier i got some old nasty bodega coffee that clearly has some form of upper in it because damn this is like oof. anyway so what was i saying because i'm i'm okay i said the ethiopian i was about to show y'all something what we get back to oh popular culture i ain't that lit and i said so america's museum exhibited you, not American, museum, not just yet, let's put Barnum so they don't think I'm just talking smack. Wow, looky here, we can go back to Wikipedia, but yet though, he, you don't know even how to look at Wikipedia. Barnum's American Museum was located at the corner of Broadway Park Row and Ann Street, what is now the financial district of Manhattan. The museum was owned by P.T. Barnum, so forth and so on, you can read it. It's called the American Museum, yes. This and what Barnum did is how the American Museum in general, that and then Richard, who's the guy in Philadelphia? Peel's, I think it's Peel. Peel's Museum in Philadelphia. And what Barnum was doing here are the formation of the modern museum and your institutions of learning like that, that you go to. Big ass exhibits. And guess what was one of the exhibits besides Joyce Heath and who is it who are also black? There were black face performers, Ethiopians. And this is how the immigrants in the world and those people came to know of you and know of these songs because they made money by selling song sheets with lyrics because people didn't really have piano at the time so when you go back to watch how it connects thank you black because we'll go right back around they'll think i got far from what i was saying when you go right back to the father of american music black see how we bring it right back home and we go to images we will see that watch this watch this you're gonna see that when you go here this is how and whoa oh god did i just get a virus just show me the damn people the picture come on here we go come on. Come on. you will see like i said what did you get you got the lyrics and you would get things like this well look who's singing oh susanna but an ethiopian Every one of us is saying, oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. Look at the lyrics. I've come from Alabama with the banjo and money. Who had the banjo? I'm going to Louisiana, my true love. Where did the love come from? Anybody bring back to Mordecai Noah and what I showed about allegedly how we talk and how it was spelled? More. Dekai Noah, and so when you read it and say he's the father of Negro minstrelsy, you see how these things get set in motion. Mm, mm, mm. Are they listening? Damn. Did you ever know that that's like love? And where does this love come from when you were singing? We were singing it in camp whenever. This is the voice of a supposed enslaved person. Now free, I guess, because he done came from Alabama singing his song in Louisiana. I probably pronounced that wrong. Kyle, but probably going to correct me. I can't really get that. Like Louisiana accent, Louisiana accent is tough. 
I try so hard, but I just end up sounding crazy. It rained all night the day I left. The weather, this is how people got it. So what is it? These Negroes can't even spell. People thought this, These many of these people were really black. Y'all yeah, don't really get this. Hmm? So to answer that question, as far as how they become and get in the household and the mechanisms and the ways, these are the ways. They were on the streets and in the bars and saloons and in the museums and the places that people went singing these songs. So they became rooted in America now. These are different and not native to England. Why? Because this is allegedly from the voice of these black folks. But many of the tunes of these songs are actually Irish shanties and, and other German stuff. I'm not getting into that complexity right now, but yeah. So don't think that you was going sitting on some uh, barrel somewhere on, in, in the plantation doing it just like this. You were not. You had your own songs. You had your own thing. And that's not the image that the world got. The world's got this. And this is why we sing Oh Susanna. But these Ethiopians, like I said, are there any other people on stage with this Ethiopian performing? No. Because what you're thinking of comes later when in 1843, four men gather in a semicircle and say they're representing the true slave because where was the true slave? Where's my man Cujo? The true slave is from Virginia. No, you got to be the true slave when you the slave of the presidents. So they took that as the authentic true slave and his attributes and what they were going to present to the world. And so when you go in 1843, by the way, I told you it was, it was one that's a week before. You can see January 31st, 1843. Hmm? And you saw the second one. Who needed to win the primaries? Oh, I have them. I didn't get it from here. I, but this was just to show the regular people because everybody ain't got the pro You get it. So the Virginia Minstrels or Virginia Serenaders was a group of 19th century American entertainers who helped invent the entertainment form known as the Minstrel Show. Led by Dan Emmett, the original lineup consisted of Emmett, Billy Whitlock, Dick Pelham, and Frank Brower. After the successful tryout in the billiard parlor, this is where they performed, of the Branch Hotel in New York City's Bowery, the group is said to have premiered to, to a paying audience nearby at the Chatham, probably on January 31st. They followed with a brief run at the Bowery Amphitheater. Hmm. Bowery Amphitheater. Hmm. February 6th, right after January 31st, 1843. Hmm. Primary got, got, then had it. Don't have to use that. This is the show to people. This is real. Okay. So they followed with the brief run at that in early February. Hmm. February 6th, early February, 1841, 43, Virginia minstrels doing oddities and vulgarities and other objectionable features. Do I need to read the rest of this now? I will. Which have hitherto characterized Negro extravaganzas. Who's playing with words and who's telling you what these things really mean? So I was playing about extravaganza and spectacle. Slapstick. They brought to the world and showed in the performance that is the first pop native to America popular culture, undeniable. What they do? It was four men who were showing vulgarities and other objectionable features, which have hitherto characterized these type of Negro extravagances. Started by the Ethiopians. Now they have banded together. That's the most popular songs in America. Let's bring it back.
back again. Matter of fact, I'll stay on the menstrual show. Same thing and type control F and go Steven. Oh, it's not going to be on here. Fine. Yeah, because he he did it with Christie's. That's why it's not on here for all you smart guys. Christie's comes after them and makes it hot. But people still listening because I could go really crazy with this one. Or is this too much? This too much? Oh, my fault. This is in the way. How do I get that out of here? My bad, y'all. I didn't know that comment thing was in the way. How do I get that out of here? Hide current comment. Wait, hide. Hide all. There you go. Y'all still with me? Huh? Should we go? Should we go a little bit like where we going? We all want to go with this. <laughs> where y'all want to go with this? Hmm? So when we go back and we see, watch this. This is so in <sighs> my people, my people. Follow me. So we have these other people, right, who become the first menstrual. So when you guys see this picture, I'm going to help you out because some of you guys have this and you float it around and do all type of jazz. I want you to look at the obvious now. Is it in this one? It may not be in this one. I did a presentation called Give the Drummer Some, and I walked you through each of these and showed you that these are those four people. Emmett was on the, I think this is Emmett right here in the middle. Dan Emmett, I think this is Frank Bauer. You get mad and say, oh, wow, look how they got us. No, you should be like, wow, what possessed you? Matter of fact, think of the Harlem Goldchilds once again. I told you they never have us in just regular postures. We're always in some disjointed, gangly type of way. Remember that, because those are the, the attributes of that clownish Harlequin, Harlequin as well, even though he stood up with a slapstick. But these aren't you. What you getting mad for? This is what Blumenbach said the Ethiopian was. And these people decided to want to be Ethiopian. This ain't got nothing to do with you. But you fragile for the fragile person should be the one sitting up here wondering, well, why in the hell did my people go around putting cork on their face doing this? And how in the world this is where it stains? So I tell you, people need to know history, we take the emotions out. This is where it does not sting you, but it has something to explain. How is this the foundational? popular culture in America, and you have the audacity to question me with anything after that. That's what we're not sophisticated enough to ask, because we don't know it. I repeat, this is the fine. I repeat it a thousand times so you can take it and go ask your college professors and everybody else, am I exaggerating? Because I will go back and show you. Uh, should I give you Dan Emmett? Well, Dan Emmett goes on to write the military drum book that they use. I showed this and give the drummer some. Yeah, he does that. Here's old Dan Emmett. Uh huh. He writes the drum and core book that the military use, folks. And he writes Dick. No, he didn't write Dixie, but he yeah he did. He did Dixie. Hmm. And the whole bit tied into it. But off of him for a second. Back to somebody we was talking about. So deeply rooted in American culture that you have sang these songs. And we didn't know. When I told you he was. There are many biographies of Foster, but details differ widely. Among other issues, Foster wrote very little biographical information, yada, 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 yada. Foster taught himself to play these things, yada, yada, yada. He returned to Pennsylvania and wrote most of his best known songs. Camp Town Races, hmm? Nellie Bly, Ring the Banjo, Old Folks at Home, My Old Kentucky Home, Old Dog Trey. Old Dog Trey, look at that, that's kind of crazy. I need to put that, flip that. Old Dog Trey. <laughs> Many of Foster's songs were used where in blackface minstrel show entertainment 
popular at the time. The father of American music was the provider of the tunes for the Black Face Minstrel Show. The father of American music, scroll up, is that my words? Known as the father of American music was the main song provider and the songs that you sing that are also state anthems are from the minstrel show which was what popular at the time what did i make up what did i have to get all that is fact want to see the funny part here's the best part of it all Many of his songs had Southern themes, yet Foster never lived in the South and visited only once during his honeymoon. All the songs that people sing or you think are coming from the mouths or at least representative of the Negro on the plantations of the South, he went one time on his honeymoon. Don't got no experience with you, but provides the songs and the voice for the Southern slave that are the tunes that are America's songs. So much so that they are state songs. Damn. Damn. Whoo. Let me just stop sharing for that. I don't think they heard me. I don't think they heard me. <laughs> The Hootie and Rob Bourne. Will you please leave me back in the chamber somewhere where it is safe, not for me, but for everyone else? Because this is the truth, not my words. Come on, Richard. You know better. Foster's doing this from the beginning. He's doing it with Christie's minstrels. So what happens is, and I can get this part. Virginia minstrels come in, but yes, it is Christie's who bring the standards we know as the different parts of the minstrel show. So yes, the Virginia minstrels do it, but this is like an early rendition. When Christie's comes in, Christie's then brings the different parts of the minstrel show where you have your oleo and your... Um, stump speech and all those type of things right so as you see they were instrumental in the solidification of the minstrel show into a three-act form so now you have this the virginia minstrels are like the you know the archaic the early parts they're the ones that say okay all of us ethiopians need to band together and make this bread and stop competing against each other they're like the wu-tang of like this scientific racism popular culture thing this is a terrible example. I would never compare them to Wu Tang. I got to think of some other way, but never Wu. Wu is for the children. But so Christie's comes along, and then Foster then provides the songs for Christie's, and they're the ones that bring the money in the in the whole industry so much so that they have menstrual theaters. Richard, as a fact, I'm pretty sure Christie's has had one in Philadelphia. Phil, uh, Phil, no. But I'm pretty sure they well, they performed all over. But Christie's is who we want to look up because Christie's folks then introduces another element that they took from those enslaved on the plantation, which is this is how the cakewalk comes into popular culture. It didn't come through you. Sorry, Negroes. The cakewalk became popular and became one of the official American dances because white men in black corps called Ethiopians banded together to form a minstrel show. And one of the main parts of their show was them doing a cakewalk. You had nothing to do once again with making it hot showing you once again you don't own nothing to do with you okay that's how the cakewalk got known not because they went to the plantations and saw the negroes do it no stephen foster went to the south one time on his honeymoon <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Y'all better learn who Fritz the Cat is. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, 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 mm. So that's where that comes from. It's Christie's. After Virginia menstruals, things get hot. Now all of a sudden, all the Ethiopians and all the other places start banding together. And that's when you start to see all of these menstrual groups just start coming out of nowhere in like a not even a year. In less than three months, you know, the, the Virginia menstruals end up going to Europe and performing and within no time because Jim Crow had already been there prior to that. But yeah, the menstrual show just starts going ham after soon out the gate menstrual show. Uh, I got a bazillion of these damn things. Menstrual, let's go to the early menstruals, early menstruals, 92, 64. Oh, they were also called the African opera, but that's a whole nother thing and y'all don't pay me enough. Um, 18, we got 99, let's give them some early, 72. Oh, here's one maybe, way down south, 1872. Oh, this is after the Civil War. I don't want to show you that. I want to show you something before. Let's go. 18. <sighs> Come on. Oh, then I can I put date? Let's put date. Let's put, I don't know, 18. Yeah, before the war. So we'll do that. Then we'll see what we got up in chat. All right. Scotland got a menstrual show by 1860. We don't want to give them that. They don't care. Oh, what was this? Virginia menstrual show hurts emancipation chances. So Virginia menstrual in Paris, y'all. Like you see, it's 1840. Let me click on this so they don't think I'm. So they come out, as you see, and start in 1843. By 1844, they are going around the world to show the representation of who is on them plantations. They are in Paris. You see it. 1844. Not even oh, a little over a year later, they are on a world tour. And this is how the world knows and has gotten in on the joke of how you are the source of entertainment. Jews Janet, the theatrical critic of the journal, is in the habit, as the readers of that paper are aware, of giving occasionally what he calls the dramatic week, which is a review of what is going on at the principal theaters in Paris. In the paper of July 8th, he bemoans the degradation of the Paris stage in the following manner. For the rest, the dramatic week has been altogether wanting in nerve and invention. No one knows what has become of the theaters. They might be called monumental ruins. Why so? The doors of which remain closed. In time of public distress and when there is a scarcity of bread, people have recourse to every kind of imitation of grain to compose that article. There is bran bread, barley bread, acorn bread. Famine has even carried people to the length. Of, I don't want to read this whole thing to y'all. And the bread, so... Dandy and Cockney in turn, man and women, uncle and nephew, this valiant fellow has no other pleasures but to make pass under the Saxon account some words of our vocabulary. This they call at the variety theater the traveling Englishman. One goes to see something new and finds a bird as old as the world. The next day, another deception is the most complete mystification which has been invented for a long time. This is talking about this. This is the affair. The theater of the Palais Royal promised you some show screen. Damn. Thank you for making. Woo. Thank you. I love people who got my. Yeah. Thank you. My bad. Share screen. I didn't get to the good part yet, so don't worry. Thank you. Whoever just hit me. All right. So this is what I was reading from. Here, I didn't get, I'm getting to the good part now. This is from Paris in 1844. It says, the next day, another deception, and this is the most complete mystification which has been invented for a long time. This is the affair. The theater of the Palais Royal promises you some minstrels from the other world. I'm glad y'all caught me just in time. The Virginia minstrels. The curtain is drawn up, and at first you see four painted wooden chairs placed on the shore of a boundless ocean. The four minstrels arrive very well pleased with themselves and take their places on their respective seats. 
No, nothing can be more ugly than these scarcely human beings. One represents a great Negro armed with a bass drum. He bears a head like one of the carnival masks. Imagine a pasteboard painted black, lips of a fabulous thickness loaded with bright vermilion. I want to pause here for a second. Let me open up another tab because I need to bring this all together for you. Now, with that said, didn't we, those who came in late, this is a chance for you to catch up. This is how we started this thing, right? Didn't we say, well, what was popular science and this scientific racism was going back to someone when we read that whole Blumenbach thing. And we look at the races of man and we see call. call no, I got that. All right. Blumenbach, in his elements of natural history, divides human species into the five races. We have the Caucasian color, more or less white, with florid cheeks, hair long, soft, and brown, running on the one hand into white, on the other into black. According to the European ideas of beauty, the form of the face and skull, most perfect, and includes all the Europeans, with exceptions of the Laplanders, the Western Asians on this side, the Ab, the Caspian Sea, and the Ganges. Lastly, the Northern Africans. Altogether, the inhabitants of the world known by ancient Greece and Rome. So Egypt is theirs. But when you go down to who? The Ethiopian race is what Blumenbach said. Now you see where the Ethiopian comes from. Black in a greater or lesser degree with black frizzy hair, jaw projecting forward, thick lips, and flat nose. Composed of the remaining Africans. There's the Negroes who pass into the Mars by means of the fullers. In the same manner as other varieties merge into one another, yada, yada, yada. So when you go and see in 1844 on the stage being represented to the world, it says, giving you this description, the imagine a pasteboard painted black, mm -hmm, lips of fabulous thickness, thick lips and flat nose, boom and bop. Loaded with bright vermilion, the hair woolly from the roots to the ends. With black frizzy hair. At sight of this drum, the audience is alarmed. The drum was a signifier in revolts in the Americas and the Caribbean and was outlawed. This is 1844, except in New Orleans. But when you see a black face with a drum, you get a little scared. At sight of this drum, the audience is alarmed, undecided. Is it a man? Is it a real Negro? Is it a white man in Japan blacking? The neighbor to this horrible Negro must be very old if he is really an old man. For he has white hair. He might be a called a bleached negress. He is dry, sleepy, stupid, and he plays on the violin like the marquee of the corners of the streets. Remember street literature? Remember street and ballad mongers? Where do they perform black? How did the songs get popular into the household? from them on street corners. But then at least, our marquee is joyous, active, pleasant, has a fine leg and a neat white cotton stocking. There was some pleasure in giving him a sou for in return for your money, you have a fine bow, such as was made at Versailles in the year of grace, 1768. This old Negro on the contrary, if again a Negro he be, will not as much as say creve to you, even if you offer him a glass of fire. His violin is a violin as the man who plays upon it is a man. Violin by the soul and the man also at the utmost the same, whatever. But there the resemblance stops. After the violin comes the guitar, simple, inoffensive, primitive instrument if left to itself. 
but see the barbarism. These savages have disfigured even the guitar. Remember, this is not you. These are white people who are Ethiopian. You know, it sounds crazy. I think I'm proving it's the truth. The guitarist in question resembles entirely a black weeping willow. This unfortunate instrument grates and shrieks under fingers as thick as his nose. Protruding, jaw projecting forward, thick lips and flat nose. As to the fourth, he is the hero of the band, the Gracioso, the lion, the bel esprit. It is he who holds out his hand for his companions. This one alone at the market will sell himself at a higher price than the three others, for he is smart, lively, impetuous, and could pull up an acre of cane in a day. Who pulls up cane? Okay. His instrument is a pair of enormous castanets with which he makes a drum movement, given the ra and the fila with uncommon vigor. The minstrels fairly bent upon their seats. Did I tell you about statues? When they tell you stand up erect black man and how you got enamored and just locked into when you saw it in the wild, whatever figures like that, and just perfect posture, you'd be like, those are men right there. That's strength. Look at how they present you in your globe trotting wink wink ways or just how they presented themselves into the world on stage. They can never sit straight in the chairs. They're always gangly and moving. Somebody say, JJ, step and fetch it. The mistrues fairly bent upon their seats. The concert begins. A concert of savages on the banks of the Ohio. I told you boat songs and river songs. Where are they? On the banks of the Ohio, they're trying to pretend. The drum beats, nodding his huge head with the grace of a monkey, playing a fine gentleman. The best they said you would be, Mordecai Noah said, was aping your masters. Hmm? The violin yelps like a cat burned alive. The guitar sets your teeth on edge. The castanets strike the air. Each of these minstrels executes his pat uh, Tibetum, and with the most entire independence. Those who listen to this horrible racket ask themselves, who is deceived here? When they have racketed, scraped, raked their cursed instruments, these minstrels, in a horrible jargon, this is called Negro dialect and Black speech, which is then what put to words and, and spelling by Mordecai, but then taken as Negro dialect, Black dialect, you call it slang and hood talk today, and a horrible jargon which must be English patois. We count a thousand adventures and no doubt make a thousand jokes. I told you about this outdoorsman and folksman in these tall tales. What do they do in their first mystery shows? Hmm? We count a thousand adventures and no doubt make a thousand jokes. Talker says to Parker, it must be confessed the Parisians are very stupid. Here they are listening to us with open mouths. And if they had not a theater where they play comedies of their own minstrels, blah, 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 blah. I can read this. Like, do you really want me to show you how crazy it gets? Do you have an idea of what the minstrel show was from the beginning and how the world got it and viewed you and learned about you? It wasn't from you. Mm, mm, mm. If they only knew who. Rob on, Sineb. Here you go. Did I put it in there? Oh, dude. Rob on and paste. Am I doing it wrong? Hold on. Oh, I'm pressing all. Oh, that's why. There you, go. there you go. I'm done. You guys can go from here. Rob Bourne, Sneb. Uh, you can bring your melanated souls in here. The hoodie, whoever else. I'm sure y'all can. I'm done. I have done my part. May Negro America bless you all. But y'all better come on. I'm about to light my 
what they say, situation here. <sighs> Nothing? Too boring? That was what? All right, fine. And then the Tigers and Euphrates, if Euphrates parted, they found Java Man, Peking Man, and Lucy gathered around Earl of Chaldea. Does that help? Does that help? Can I get some applause then? <laughs> and then what happened is that Technicolor coat Joseph had <laughs> I will now be retreating back into the realm. No, man, let me get Georgia here. Hopefully that answered your uh your uh wife's question. Did it? If not No, oh, yeah, it, 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 it answered the question. No, it was it's good information. I just wanna say before you uh before you close, a brother about uh forty five minutes ago was saying that Dr. Carr uh, put this information out, and I would just say I disagree because a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, our so-called black philosophers and stuff in these universities, uh, they can't speak the way that you're speaking because of the platforms that they on. So, like, I, I respect what you do because, like, you actually go all the way into the information that make black men say lift up their heads. Like, with all the distractions we got, you when you teach, you make me stop doing what I'm doing because I hear stuff that I never heard before. And like the, what I'm saying, Dr. Carr and them, they know this information, but they're not going to teach what you teach because they're going to come under fire. So like, I've never heard them talk about Mordecai Noah on a level or nothing like that. None of them is going to talk about that. They can't say that they never heard of these people. So yeah, nah, that's why I respect what you do. I appreciate that. I really do. But yeah, they're gonna, Dr. Carr is my man. I love him. But also, here's the thing. Like I, I and we are in a little bit different age where we are literally the children of um, hip hop. We are the hip hop babies, and and the ones our our children that come after us are obviously the same thing. What does that mean? Is we have a different source of information that even we could pull from that Dr. Carr obviously was there and in people of that era, but they're not the babies of it. They're the babies of a different time, so they're influenced by certain things. Not to say that one is bad or anything. What I'm trying to say is our references become, could become a little bit clearer because we are like, we live through these crazy things and trying to understand it and had different resources when we tried to understand it. So we didn't start at the same points that they did, you know, and we were more open to, we're not necessarily acolytes of the same institutions that they come from. And it's not a knock on anything. It's just how time goes. Like what I'm trying yeah. to say, we have yeah. gotten our information from different circles than they did. Which I is, think, you know, and I, I think, cause when we, when, when we read the stories about how our ancestors was balking back against the Mordecai Noah's and the, the guy that owned the, the globe trotters and all that kind of stuff. I, I, this is what I think. Cause I, I'm a, I like Dr. Carr too. I just think that when they start getting jobs at those universities, some of the stuff that we talk about, they can't talk about. Is yeah, they, uh, uh, they can't bring that into the uh, to, into the curriculum because if they could, they would do it. We would well, know. We would have this knowledge. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. But it's also like my reference comes from various areas that they may not have a reference into. And that's just like, it's one of those things where everybody can't know everything. Mine just happens to be a, a little bit, uh, and it's intentional, um, uh, multi-headed, if you will. And what I mean by that is, okay, you can know the history of Richard Allen and them, but that don't mean you may necessarily know the history of how basketball is. But there were crossovers and connections with the two that you can make just because you may know, okay, I know the history of X and do I, can I relate it to something like popular culture or something like the drum or something like where people may not see any pollinization, but you see it just because of your references. Well, damn, I could take hip hop. And if I understand the history of this music thing and how this came about, that could be an avenue for me to pull people in and say, understand that this is a business. Understand how these things happen, 
right? But that's coming from references of I have a hip hop culture that I can lean on and I was a part of in certain ways and whatever to add to the story. Dr. Carl may not have that. So when I say, no, I know how to talk to George and the people and the younger people in the chat and I get where they even may disagree or say, I, I understand that we're from the same source. There comes to be a disconnect at some point, just like, although I pray it doesn't happen for too long, there will be a point where it will be somewhat of a disconnect between what I may be able to impart and how the young, it may need to be somebody uh, in the middle between me and the younger, younger people, right? Because at some point, my references to build bridges may not necessarily be there just because of the time difference. I hope I, you know, that wasn't too convoluted. I think, I think, like my generation and like the younger generation, when they hear you speak, because uh, a lot of us want to have a voice out. So when we hear you speak, you know, you educate a lot of us on how to speak to some of our open enemies, like with intelligence, not from emotional rants and stuff like that. So I, I just think that. A lot of a lot of the people from that generation saw what happened to Dr. Leonard Jeffries. So they, some they, of thank you. You were listening yesterday, damn it. That yeah, they the main me point I was trying to get across. Yo, bro. Yeah, that yeah, was the main point. Yes. Was like, look, okay, listen, bro. We're out of time. I have clearly seen this before. This is not from nobody, bro. Here, go, here, go. Listen, check this out. I have seen this before. I joke about it because this is where we're from. This is how we get to the serious stuff and try to handle it. We can't run from it. It happened in West Africa before a slave ship came and whatever. It's cultural to us. Getting that, understanding that there is truth and we can build these things, right? So I go, hey, I know how to do it. Yo, is, is Kyrie Craig Hodges 2.0? Boom, got him. Now they're like, huh. Okay, so now look, isn't this this time in the movie I asked where... Kyrie turns NOI and starts wearing suits and starts spouting NOI stuff. Why? Because I've seen that playbook happen in our lifetime in various ways and many times. But I look and say, one, that won't happen because it goes to what I've been saying before. We're holding on to institutions from our daddy and grandfather's era that don't exist in the same way. Well, if that's going to play out, what happened was that comes from a world and an environment where there was a fight. This is how the woke people don't even really understand this history. There was a fight taking place in academia. Yes. Was it Dr. Clark and an and, and old girl just encapsulated by themselves? No, there was a broader fight taking place in academia that included Dr. Leonard Jeffries. But we go up until well, Dr. Clark right about Egypt and was the right lady right about the this and that. Dude, you're, you're taking one point, like I say, stuck in the forest, won't step back from the trees to understand what was going on. Right? And so now you have academics who are trying to present this information in certain ways and, and whatever, and it's being taken as anti-Semitic uh, and anti-this and anti-that. But at the same time, you got Jesse spouting off with what, what was it, Jaime Town and Farrakhan, as fiery as ever, that, that gets all of that wrapped into something where Dr. Linus Jeffries was damn near banished for the rest of his career. And, and, and let me say this before I jump off, because I'm in, I'm in uh, BJ's. Um, and, that, and that's the thing, like you got a, uh, this woke culture a lot of them is opening their mouth and talking, but don't have no reference to history and know what the hell they're talking about. What happens is when you start teaching, you invoke that spirit of those Dr. Jeffries and those people back up for a lot of us that actually want to have a voice. But we want to know what the hell we're talking about when we talk. We want to be able to go do the reference in history, not just this woke shit where the enemy is looking at you like, man, you you, you talking our talking points and don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> like you're, You actually teach us how to engage in conversation where they got to be so so-called woke culture. They don't, man, th these people are dumb. Like they don't know anything. Like the I stuff that you break down, they don't have no, they don't have, they don't have the historic points to actually point out when you crit, when you're coming at these groups. So what I'm saying is a lot of us, a lot of us that do watch, we, 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 we look at the people like Dr. Jeffries in them and we want to invoke that spirit back so we can start reteaching our people. Yeah, I, I agree. But we have to, we have to, realize that it's 
it has to be a way of life. And not I'm not talking about where you sit down every day and read the great scrolls of Carter G and whatever, but just really trying to understand like, yo, first of all, I got to have a clear assessment of who I am and in my history before I go out and battle this, which means I have to understand, well, damn, if you're talking about a year or time period, where am I in the story? No matter where you are, whether you're talking about the 1850s or the 1950s, you're not clear on where you are in the story, but you're trying to define all these things within that time period. And what I mean by that, this is the part that's been locked out of history because the only place that you know for sure, which is not necessarily true, is on a damn plantation. And then you ask, is Rob Bourne in here? Well, damn, well, if that's the case, I'm going to catch them up right there, Rob Bourne. Go ask the typical nigga, well, since that's what you're claiming so hard, what were you doing on a plantation? And 99% will have no idea. So now we're claiming that we are, we are uh, uh, whatever of this slavery thing, and we have no idea what was even going on there. The true definition of loss. But yet we want to put on the glove, look out the window, and see the pain Instead of just going out the window and building, no, I'm, the way I'm going to get out of here is put this glove on. I'm going to punch this window so hard and the world going to hear me yell. And what you going to do? Straight out there, jump out. $500 billion later, look where, where that boy is. For what? For what? Nick Cannon has gone to be a buck. Okay? <laughs> Y'all don't see... What the crazy stuff. If people take a step back, they don't put that boy to be a, a, a buck. You was on America's whatever. <laughs> yo, yo, true. First, <laughs> yeah. I want to say, yo, true. First, I want to say it was a beautiful presentation. It was some beautiful information dropped. Um, I was able to easily connect the things that you was you were talking about due to Due to my background in history and been able to connect certain certain people to places like Mordecai Noah and other people. Um, my question was, how did all the things that you were talking about lead to the to the formation of these religions, these offshoot religions, you know, the Moors? the Hebrew Israelites, because as you can tell, as you, as you said, we were searching for identity and mm -hmm. these people were depicting us in this way, mm -hmm. which wasn't actually us, but this is what they showed to the world. So right. how did these depictions and these okay. ideas lead to the formation of these offshoot religions? Right. So what they did was, and that's, so now I don't want to say offshoots because this was a Christian country. So anything outside of that will be, will be considered offshoot. And I also want to say you didn't necessarily, hold on, there's one person, I'll get you in in a second, Foxy Moon. Um, you didn't necessarily um, have too many options and you didn't necessarily have the reference. So before we go into why didn't they all start doing uh, Kendombe or, or one of the star all worshiping a Nazi or whatever, that access may not have been there like we think to do those things. You may not have the reference because what makes those systems powerful is they take place in a specific area that helps them be as powerful as they are, right? That system that they have right. in Ghana and that connection and Benin in those places have that power because of the, where it is. So now you're talking about porting that and extracting that and that, that obviously created its own challenges. Plus, there was separate connections. So with that said, yes, there was under this Christian thing or whatever, but it was still a wrestling with how to deal with that from the beginning. Because initially, like I'm saying, when you look at the sources, we did it as an avenue of freedom, knowing that you had to be Christian if you had any contemplation of wanting to be free. But early on, we still kept with um, our West African and our Creole, this, 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 this hodgepodge, not want to say hodgepodge, but this syncretism that's taking place in the Americas. This so Rob Bourne jumps in and starts yelling about what's going on in Mexico or the Caribbean and all of these type of brotherhoods and all those type of things, right? That's the point in history we're fighting to hold on to what we're losing as well as we're becoming a new people. 
this is the thing that we are wrestling with as well. So it's not like we can get here and like, we just identify this. No, we're literally in the midst of becoming a new people. So having a hard definition at some point is, is going to be a challenge because you are becoming, right? So now you say, okay, so what's helping us become? Well, we're all sharing this unique experience with these blood ties and this history, and those become fun, foundational points for the forming of community. And you see that's what lie at the roots of this organization structure. Well, at the end of the day, before we got a slave shit or whatever, listen, that the old lady was sick, we got to take care of her. We can't have no dead bodies laying in the middle of the slave plantation. Where we are, we're going to have somebody take care of them and make sure we don't get spooked out by grandma when she come back. So we got to keep these rituals. We'll hide them this way and blah, 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 blah. These interpretations that come later come out of rejection. Like, wait a minute. The first thing on the document says Christians before it said white people. It said the rights were afforded to Christians. So when it comes to adversity and pushing away an option, well, damn it, it was Christians that took me. All that white stuff came later. It was Christians. So now when we start to now fight back, it, well, well, I'm still religious. You know how we do? I still believe in something, just not that. There's this wrestling with it. This is why we didn't hold on and say, like, yo, we're going to be revolutionary. We're going to do it, and it's going to be an African put in there at least something right and 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 the roots of it being called mother for a specific reason and what we could wrestle with, with what we had Blumenbach was science of the day there was no oh he lying because we got dna data that was science the bible was a historical reference of the day period i know it hurts you wasn't there during this time none of us were <laughs> Those were the options. But then, you know, I'm saying this other thing about, okay, so what's the option? The, the Muslims didn't have that much impact here. The Jews didn't. But the Jews and the Muslims were sort of afforded certain freedoms because they were given this path, like I'm saying. So did the Irish and all these other people who weren't necessarily white or Protestant, although Christian, many of the Irish and Italians were Roman Catholic, which caused its own controversy. Look in Philadelphia. So they have to adapt, drop vowels and drop baby Jesus for old Jesus and Protestantism and make their own things. But they never this never brought across to us like that. We wrestle with identity. That whole trip that I'm talking about from the time they snatch you from the jungle and just midst of, of defining and redefining these things. And all these things come across. Yes, there, there was a connection to a more in some fashion. Yes, this may happen. Yes, I can show you records where they have Anthony and Tom the Moore in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, in the 1640s, I can show you why that name of Moore was used for that specific reason in a whole bit. But then we get wrapped up into, this is why I'm wrapping up, Savio. The biggest thing, it becomes one big huddle of identity politics not getting no work done and this is in my opinion what we use as a crutch and an excuse for not just getting shit done damn damn i'm just saying man we can spend a whole time well well okay we're gonna start this meeting to build this or what you call yourself or what you call yourself or what you praying to, what you doing that like yo right. can somebody just pick a hammer up and start building this shit? build this shit Right. Uh, Carter G. Wilson spoke about that. And he said, we don't need no more preachers and orators. We need producers, builders. He wrote but that. Listen, but listen, at least the Europeans found a way to do it. Y'all, I'm not Rob Warren going to be mad. Let me break all this down. Freemason, I keep trying to tell people it could have been anybody. The Europe was dying. These people needed a way to get this information from these aristocrats to everybody else to build it. And they chose these craft guilds to do that. They chose the people who weren't necessarily literate. And they found ways to get their brain levels up a little bit thinking while still doing work. That's why Masons have tools. <laughs> Well, why are you learning all this esoteric shit? Nigga, you're building the churches. So now while you're building and doing physical work, you can take those type of the tools and see the esoteric meanings. But you're not sitting there with a hammer just looking at it. You're using it. The problem is you got all these tools and we're looking at the esoteric value instead of building any goddamn thing. <laughs> Bro. 
bogged out, yo. They did yeah. that for a reason. Yeah, they keep crap if, gills. Okay, Rob. See if there's any other people in the back that got some questions, oh, yeah, yeah. man. There you go. Who's that? Foxy Moon. Hello. Hello. Yeah, what's up, Rob Bourne? What's going on? Nah, ain't nothing, brother. I just, you know, catching the catching the live. This, this is some powerful stuff here. It's very Peace powerful. Peace, salute. Oh, go ahead. Hello, how are you? How are you? We got. Hey, I'll say this. Y'all yeah. got to come back and, and keep doing more lives like this. I know y'all got away from it for a while because there's a large uh, portion of. Uh, uh, oh, there, there must be a delay in. Uh... Sorry, there might be a delay. No problem. Yeah, you're not. You're not you're not I don't know what's going on. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I, I, I just want to say, you, you guys got to get back, man. Y'all, you Rob Bourne Sinead, because in, in these black spaces, there's a large portion of other teachers that's teaching us influencing the minds, man. For the last four or five years, y'all was bringing that heat. But y'all been like, really going for like the last six, seven months. So when you come back, uh, you know, it's people here responding to y'all because people have been waiting for y'all to come back with this information because there's a lot of other stuff that's coming out, like new <laughs> stuff. People hearing all kinds of shit that they never heard before. You know what I'm saying? So, And, and I'm going to tell you, it's enticing to the ear because the ear never heard it. So, like, when you come back and you teach this kind of stuff to the younger people, you know, what I mean? you know they gravitate towards it because it, it has it has a more of a historical effect to them. So y'all got y'all got to stay around, man. Uh, and, you know what, George? I, honestly, y'all got to no, donate to these guys, man. Give them a reason to stay around. I, I, but that's true. Yeah, I, yeah. I appreciate that. But I, like, you know, I just you're right. That's all I say. It, it's a it's a bigger conversation, but it's it's like yeah, it's a way, there's a way bigger conversation, and it's it, it, it's not even that. It's because you know. I might jump on a live from here and there and talk about whatever the topic of the day is. But, like, bro, this this takes time. It takes, regardless if you know this information or you have it, like, you got to, like, they, it ain't just waking up doing a talk show. It ain't just us in the barbershop having barbershop talk. No, this message needs to be clear, precise, and documented so that you can use this as a weapon. That's All I'm saying, that's I mean, I, that's, but, well, hold on, brother Rob. Oh, go ahead, just go ahead. I just want to say one more thing. All, okay. good. Go ahead. All I ever asked to Hootie and Rob Bourne and NBK for years, all I wanted, like, yo, can y'all just put me in the background so I can be historian to the stars? I don't want a mic or no page and vibe or nothing or to be known. So I can prevent people from breaking the glass and jumping out the window where when you thought, okay, we don't have this year where it's polite and nature boy in the ninth inning, like I said yesterday, who would have thought from the land of woke topianism, Ron Dalton and some random thing that Rob Bond and Garfield and all these guys and told up a thousand times would be the international story in the ninth inning. So if you don't think the spotlights are coming, you are out of your ever loving mind. Go ahead. All right, and I'm gonna say this. Um, I don't know if you was there, um, Danny. Like there was a thing I did on Clubhouse, and it was about this topic, but in a different aspect, and it was dealing with the culture of Jewish culture and slavery, right? And you know. The way I dealt with it was a way where they tried all they and they might to anti semite me, but you couldn't because all I'm doing is this is the history. I don't got to yell at you. I don't got to scream at you. I don't got to say nothing to you. And like 10 rabbis got up there. They tried with all their might and there was nothing they could do. I said, will you admit that this is an anti-black and you have not denounced it yet? When are you going to denounce this anti-blackness that is inside of your religion that is responsible, uh, ideological reasoning for two slave trades? Listen, brother, you know why... I'm going to stop right here, but right. at the end of the day, this is what we do it for. 
that that was the best time I had on the internet in three years, man. Four years. I don't know. That might have been the best time because that's all I was dealing with was with them. And they couldn't do nothing. But Listen. you know me, we the, 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 the people is busy, man. We out here moving and shaking, George. But at the same time, look, so what I tried, this is I've tried to do, and it's just my personality, who I am, whatever. Where I, I get you in the second D, right? Where you got uh, yeah, I grew up in the era where Khaled was there. I used to go see him and that one, whatever, and that there's different phases you were in different ways you attack it, whatever. But you start to understand, like, wait a minute, I was told I was telling this to Rob on last night. Like, you understand the power and anything. Like, wait a minute. The reason, oh, oh, Khalil, it works because Khalid was a genius. Like, Malcolm was literate and smart and spent weeks in a bookstore to do those things. But you then look where, wait, wait a minute. Okay, it wasn't a whole bunch of you to this and you to that and that, that, that. No, it was a lot of times fact-based stuff where you have to look at like, huh. So that's more powerful when you start to study these things. One, you know where you are in the story. You can put your good points and bad points if you're being honest, right? But now you understand the reference for everybody else. Philadelphia, you can understand George because that's how the Irish and the black people played it. And then, then yes, there's fights and skirmishes and whatever, but they the duty the is you understand this. Okay, nah, this type of boy, okay, nah, he blah 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 blah. And they interact in their way, and the Irish and the Italians figured out. So all of these combos <laughs> start to happen. But they all can say, Well, look at you. And the problem is we stand there with nothing to defend ourselves. All we can go with is so, well, you was a slave. And you don't know nothing about when you was free to be like, yes, there was enslavement. My people were enslaved, but I got a whole Gatling gun full of free people who did stuff. And you know what was the impediment the whole time? And that's when you just look. Hey, can I bring this to the table for you and uh, Rob Warren? Something I meant to, I meant to say earlier, because you know, I, I know I got my nonprofit, my urban nerves. I just got, um, can you hear me, Danny? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just got funding, and I'm ready. I'm actually getting yeah, some man. more funding. Uh, I'm creating a debate league. I'm trying to get um, a group of kids down here in Philly and um, on the national stage of a debate team. But I, I was going to reach out to you and Rob Bourne anyway because I want uh, – and I can pay y'all now because if we got the funding. I want to start uh, imparting this information into some of the kids through our Urban Nerds program. Um, I'll be. That's why I said I'm going to email you because I'm going to uh, – Call yeah. you where we can talk and we can impart that because this information now, some of this information we need to go to the children. I want to put it into the, I want to put, uh, cause we, like I said, we put these youth into um, uh, open forums, open debate teams. So I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be talking now, but that's why I said I created my nonprofit to use it for our own kids. Right. So, well, you have the great thing about Philadelphia in particular, they have funding that goes to the art programs there and, you know, this and everything else. So now it's just a matter. OK, we have access to the library company, which is next door to the Philadelphia Historical Societies. And this is what I say in Philadelphia in particular. So now the kids can get involved. Just have a marker program. I think I got it. If I seen the document or whatever, I got all of the black markers that's around there. There you go. Your history starting points. It tells the story right there. And so now all these kids is walking around and realize like, damn, I've been walking past this blue sign the whole time. I didn't realize that said the African Fire Company. I didn't realize that said the first black magazine publishing in America. I didn't realize that said the, the first free African society, all these things. And now these things, they're walking around and the world's going to open up. And like Richard just put in there, now you understand like, well, now you can go and look up who Francis Johnson is and realize he was living. There you go. Hold on. Hold on. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Where you at, Richard? Yeah, don't forget to let people in. We got the questions, man. Wait, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm gonna get them in a second. Hold. I just want to show this to 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 Richard because I know he. That's my man. So we look up Francis Johnson. Francis Johnson. You want to see what we were doing musically? You want to see the difference? Thank you, Richard. Because now it just came back to me. Francis Johnson. Give me a uh, musician. Damn it. Where is my man, Francis Johnson? Don't make me do it. Hold on, y'all, because this is going to, once again, hopefully fill in some holes. Pause. Francis Johnson, musician. Okay. 
Okay, here we go. Come on. So this is what we were doing musically, my friends, when they was making fun of us. Francis Johnson draws Philadelphia and whatever, and we learn, uh, I'll just go to Wikipedia and read it. And we learn uh, that what was an American musician and prolific composer during the antebellum period. Is this not the minstrel era? He dies and his music is legacy one year before the minstrel show goes. What were black people doing while the Ethiopians said we was doing crazy? This is what we were really doing, performing as a virtuoso of the now rare key Kent Bugle and the violin. He wrote more than 200 compositions of various styles, operatic airs, and Ethiopian minstrel songs. So you asked the impact of this on popular culture? Yes, that was, it was yeah, yeah. See, told you, be, be kind of careful before you jump totally out the window and understand it gets more complex that people can ever imagine. But my point is, he wasn't performing uh, Ethiopian minstrel as far as, you know, massa do this or that. He was performing uh, marching music or whatever that you have going on. But in Philadelphia, George, so you learn that by, you then look at the sign like, hey, well, damn, this is right over by the AME church. So now when I'm walking past my little child, so what well, we got to do with the music and boom, standing right there as a sign says, America's first native born master of music. Well, guess what we learned today? We learned the father of American music was an Ethiopian and putting out old Susanna songs, but we now... This is what I'm saying. When we know ourselves in the story, it don't matter who in the room. Let them call you all these names. You got ammo if you know the story. America's first native-born master of music was who? A prolific African-American composer, trumpeter of the first troop, City Cavalry, bandmaster, 128th Regiment, volunteer infantry, which means he fought for this country. He was a major force in early American music and traveled widely. So when they're making fun of you and you don't have no response, you go, well, you so go up there and crack up and look what you did, crack up. You go, no, why were you acting a fool like that when that's not what we were doing? Do you know who Francis Johnson is, among others? That's the difference with the kids know, George. And it's all, this is free. You walking around through all of these streets. You got a whole 25 books just on walking for free. Ashe? Ashe, let the people win for the questions, oh, man. All right. What is it with the people? With the, you answer all the questions. Go ahead, man. Nah, bro. That's what we got. This is for. I want them questions out. So that's it. It's, it's, Hold on. It's Did everybody good, get in? I don't even know if I did this right. Is everybody in? Read the Tabio and hmm. Go ahead. Now everybody's lit. Nobody want to talk. Wait. I just wait. I just muted everybody by mistake. Hold on. How I did that? My fault. I, wait. Oh shit. What did I do? Did I mute? No, I didn't mute nobody. Y'all muted yourself. Didn't I? Hey, I want to say peace, uh, brother Danny, peace. Professor hey, Rock. No. Brother Ra, Brother George. Peace. Uh, I don't, this is not so much of a question. It's more just to say that I want to thank you when you do come on because I'm being educated on things that uh, I'm not fundamental Black American. My family's from the Caribbean. And when they came over here, they don't talk about Black American and they don't talk about slavery or anything like that. It's not until I went into, uh, what you call white people's school is where I learned mm -hmm. about slavery. And that's like third grade. Um, so mm -hmm. to educate us and, and, and not just sit, stand on a podium and talk, but bring receipts and show us, you know, where, where to connect the dots. And you're right. As far as people are holding on to old paradigms and there's a shift collectively that people are awakening up to and, some are rediscovering, you know, through DNA, if, if, who they are, what they are. I'm like, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all of that. And then some, 
You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, if 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 you want to even get more spooky, it's like shit. We part of the 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 universe. Like our DNA is tethered to the earth. Like we're part mm -hmm. of the solar system. So it's like when people get out of their head about oh you're Hebrew or you're Christian or you're more or you're this you're that. It's like yo, wh what happens? You know when 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 sh when stuff really breaks out. You know what I mean? Like war warfare type stuff. All that religion and all you being this, that, and the third is not going to make any sense. You need to have your ammo. You need to have your your provisions uh, because we're, we're really dying out here at alarming rate. And it doesn't matter what complexion you are, if you're Christian, if you're, you know, a, a, mm -hmm. a Muslim. You know what I'm saying? They, they took Brother Malcolm out. It didn't so matter if he was black or if he was Muslim. He, he was trying to connect and he was bigger and greater than... And they still got him. So, I agree. Let me just, I appreciate the comment. I definitely do. And I appreciate your support as well. Let me just add one little thing to that. And this is, this is only key because this is, this is, this was the essential part of why Dahoudi is in the chat and Kabul and was there from the beginning, beginning, right? Why intentionally the focus of the stories and the information wasn't on our people when we were enslaved, because that is something that we will grasp onto, no problem. What's missing from the whole story is when we were free, because then we could we could see how we function in this system. It holds two people. You can see the, the, the effects of two people. Okay, we're free, and what are we doing? We're free, and what's happening, and how are they responding to us being free? because then we could see the root of it. This is what they, they don't really want to deal with. When you have somebody enslaved, by virtue of them being enslaved, they have no choice, they have no right, they have no say there. So you understand that, even though it's terrible in the whole bit, yes. But so now you have someone that's free, alleged to be free. Well, what is the impediment? Because isn't this the question today? So why can't y'all just get ahead and blah, blah, blah? Well, if you look at the history of things from these people that we talk about that we've just now magically discovered, like, wait a minute. Like I say, right down the block from where Francis Johnson lived, those black people to this day have the oldest owned property by black people in America. To this day, right in Philadelphia, indisputable, they have owned it for over 200 some odd years. What's their name? What's their name, uh, what's their name again, Danny? I ain't here. It's called the AME Church of Richard Allen. Oh, okay. That yeah, man yeah, yeah, yeah. is the oldest, the oldest black owned land in America. We need to understand that. That's the free African societies buying and what they did to this day. So, what they're looking at and judging is these people, free people, organizing and doing things, and they are a threat. And how do you now treat them? And I keep saying they settle with hey you may be free but you will never be equal your choice of being equal is what go down to that port of philadelphia or to boston or to new york and get your woolly hair on the boat to liberia now, imagine what the people has to wrestle with, even to this day, if we're being honest. Well, damn, I am of African descent. But at this point, I am a unique, quote unquote, tribe, if you will. Doesn't deny my at West African roots, just like they not all the same over there. Why we can no, we're an amalgamation of all that plus our experiences of dunking and dancing on this side of Atlantic. Period. Period. So now we got that to identify with, which is that amalgamation that you're talking about of all those things in the midst of people going around saying, no, 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 they not the people that start in the colleges and the benefit societies and the Negro towns and the music and it is. These people are dancing dummies. What I do, I need to pull out again, who's vulgar and have oddities who act like this. Point, once again, you have no control of your body or your image. 
you have an image awards because it comes out of a fight that has been going on back since the Ethiopians over your physical body and the image of you. That's why you have an image awards. Hopefully that will be clear, right? You got an image awards because obviously something happened to your image where you feel you need a medal or something for what you're doing for the image. Yes or no? Hmm. Hotep, I don't like dead air. Somebody say something. Habari, Ghani, Ashe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically what you're saying is that all these things, the image awards, the essence awards, all those have those things stemmed out of us doing, trying to find our own identity due to what these negative images being put on us through the years and our identities being formulated by outsiders. Watch this, y'all. Watch this, y'all. Remember what he just said? And I love this. Thank you. Because watch this, y'all. I'm going <laughs> to drill this home into you hard-headed Negroes' heads, even if it kills you. It won't kill you, though. It's going to make you stronger. Watch this. Don't move from what you said and all that blah, blah, blah. That sounds like a psyops on us. Oh, no, because watch. You're going to see now how it all makes sense of what I'm saying. Wait, is this the one? Um, no, I'm gonna get the right one before I show it because you uppity Negroes have jumped on my throat. You know, he's tying his hand tight. In. Hold on, just give me one second. Bear with me, Sabio. I ain't forget what you said. Yo, smarter than myself, but you gonna I learn. You stupid. I love I you. you. You my dude. You my Yo, dude, watch, bro. Watch, I watch, love you, dog. Watch. Okay, I'm gonna get a good copy for you though because y'all gonna never forget this. By the time it's over, and I'm glad you said, just bear with me. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating. I'm not hesitating. I'm just talking to I can actually find it a good copy for you because I know how you wretched Negroes are. Is this one right here? No, that's the same one. Bear with me. Bear with me. It's going to pay off. It's going to pay off. Is this one? There we go. We can use this. Just give me the whole thing. Give me the whole thing, please. Come on. Come on. Come on. Do, 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 do. Oh, Lord. You, oh, Lord. This ain't the whole thing. All right. I'm going to get the whole thing for you. I ain't going to do that. What I'm going to tell you is, Sabio, what you said is the essence of all of that. And I have to show you because I read it yesterday. But oh, is this it? Oh, you in trouble now. You in trouble now. So, folks, I'm going to read it. And I'm going to learn it, and you're going to learn it for the 97 millionth time how powerful this tool is once it loads so I can stop trying to set it up. There it is. So now I will go to share my screen, and you Negroes for the 99th million time will see the impact. Some of you guess what it is? Of course, some of you did. What is the first... Black newspaper in America. And then this is when everybody says Freedom's Journal. When was it created? He always asks, because I get my people that timeline we're talking about, George. 1827. Okay. Volume one, number one. Sabio, this is what I keep saying to all of us. I can't make I can't make this bigger. How do I make this bigger? Okay, let me do it this way. Come on. Because y'all gonna say, oh, he not reading it right. Okay. We wish to plead our own case. Too long. Wait, don't you move, because they're gonna call you a liar. We wish to plead our own case. Too long have others spoken for us. Too long has the public been deceived by misrepresentations. Now, let me slow down. This is 1827. Is the minstrel show created yet, guys? Yes or no? Somebody? 
When is the menstrual show created? This is why I rob on. I tell you, like, 1842, 1843. Thank you. Thank you. So is the menstrual show created at this time? So they're not talking about the menstrual show, right? Agreed? No, sir. Okay. No, sir, they're not. Who are they talking about then? They're you talking know about now. the Ethiopians. Thank you very much. They're talking about the Ethiopians and who has the newspaper? Mordecai uh, uh, Noah. Noah. Mordecai mm, Noah, mm, once again, mm. has the section in the National Advocate, which comes out in 1821, called African Amusements, where he is making fun of, you're talking about our institutions and what we're up against, the African Grove Theater, which is the first black theater in America. Mordecai Noah, the sheriff, the most powerful Jewish man in America, a playwright and what have you, is what? You saw the Wikipedia, I didn't make that up. The father, they say, of Negro minstrelsy. <clears throat> So now when you have a people coming out, watch this. You're going to see the powers. Uh, who's that? Uh, the sister. Watch this as well. Uh, uh, slave, I put it, Emancipation, New York. What year was that? When did New York emancipate? Huh. So it seems that when New York had finally got written of its slavery, a journal came about with their own voice talking about freedom months before that in preparation by the free people before them is any one listening yet so when they then say they're talking to us they're talking to black folks that we wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us too long has the public been deceived by misrepresentations in things which concern us Dearly, I told you surveillance is popular entertainment, cops in 48 hours. First 48. Hmm? So then you got that, right? And what concerns us daily? So that's the answer to your question about that, that whole thing. But then this is where Sinev comes in, like, I'll take it from here, truth. Let me get this part. So this is where Sinev then comes in and shows you, well, after this happens, you have still the story of us and this identification wrapped up in this newspaper. Well, how so? Well, when you look at the founders of the paper, Russ Worm, right, and Samuel Cornish, you'll find out that this paper ended after it was two years because of a fight of whether we go back to Africa or stay in America, which divided as far as a fight, the black community to a degree. And we never learned about Freedom's Journal or that fight in our history books. But yet the Woketopians will come around centuries later and use this story and these people and our history or this definition as things to tee off on and throw darts and call them every disparaging name in the book. So here we are. Any questions? I'm just saying I'm baffled. This is so newsworthy. I I never knew about any of this. I didn't even know that July 4th was it, 1827, New York was emancipated. Yeah. Wow. 
So what happens is in the in the north you have something called gradual emancipation. That's the process in New York. I think it was the first one was they they put this into legislation. I think John Jay and them did it around 1799, and it was for a certain period that they would gradually set these ways of emancipation. So you know this idea that that Philadelphia and New York and Boston just came to this conclusion or whatever is garbage. They had a way to make sure it worked out financially and whatever they were trying to do before them niggas in the North got free. Um, and so that's so that's thing. about what uh, a whole century later. That, so so okay, so I, my head is spinning right now, brother Danny. So. <laughs> It's okay. spinning. Wait, so I'm trying to wrap my little peon around this. That nah, you ain't no peon. Each one teach one around here. That's exactly, but for real, this is like making me like even smaller than. I mean, because so the South. Mm -hmm. I can't even articulate this correctly because okay. you really just blew. My so there's, there's slavery in the South and the North. That okay? No, that yeah, 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 yeah. But the way certain people's books are written is they made it seem like the North was like always free. It was always milk and honey. Right. Uh, and, you know, we didn't have the, we didn't have the same type of uh, slavery or racism as the South did. Rhode Island was the number one uh, slave, of, uh, slave import along with New York before Charleston, South Carolina. Mm. Brooklyn had the most uh, slaves at one point, period. They were the ones growing the vegetation and the food to feed the enslaved people of the Caribbean. That's how sick that people don't really want to say. We were enslaved in Brooklyn and other places um, to grow those crops. We weren't eating those crops. They were yes to supply some of the people here, but a good portion were going to the Caribbean because they didn't have uh, land enough land because of sand, obviously, to grow vegetation in exchange for other products, other foodstuffs. This is where you have a triangular trade that's taking place with the Caribbean and others and people and product are moving around that way. This is how you was in Jamaica one day and in Brooklyn the next or South Carolina one day and in the Bahamas the next. There's another triangular trade, which we have zero idea about. But anyway, that's what's going on. So the sick twisted part when you take a step back again is you got Joe folks over in Long Island and Brooklyn growing his vegetation so they could feed other Black folks, so they could cut down sugar cane in Kingston and what have you. Can I tell you a Can I tell you a fun fact, a brother Danny? Uh, mm -hmm. So Domino Sugar got their sugar from Grenada, uh, and and the big company there is in Brooklyn. Well, it was. I don't know if it's moved. It was Long Kent. Yes, it was, and that's actually where Carol Walker, people should know, did her uh, Aunt Jemima, I think it was, sugar statue on another note, sister. People need to look up who Carol Walker is. Those are into art, but go ahead. Well, what I wanted to say was um, I'm indirectly entwined with the president of the Domino Sugar and how I found out uh, because my father, my mother's father, grandmother, she was a spiritualist from Grenada. And she actually did a reading or readings for the president of Domino Sugar Company. Um, and that. how I found and how so this was all unraveling by me doing just more spiritual work. Uh, I knew that my great grandmother, you know, was a spiritualist. She did tea leaf readings, but her mother was the one that read for the president of Domino Sugar. So I started doing my own little research, thank goodness for the, you know, for the internet. And that's how I found out that they were exporting uh, the sugar canes from Grenada up into Brooklyn. And that's how, that's essentially how he became, you know, wealthy was because he was taking those sugar canes up to Brooklyn and manufacturing them there. So, so you I, have a couple of things that's going on with that. And that's actually how the Jews get involved in this in that regard and where they come into the story because then you have the Jews of Rhode Island in particular uh, getting in New York, getting involved in the rum trade. So sugar cane might have been, that's small amounts that may be sitting there, but they're sending runoff from um, the sugar cane production. And that molasses, oh, actually, hold on, let me just show. I know how the black people are. I gotta go soon, but um, let me just show. So. 
because uh, then they gonna say he be making stuff up. I know the Negro mind, I know it. So let me see. Go to the old Negro machine again. And come true on. story. Hold on. Why are you second. going down this road? Are you are you going to be showing black Jews or what? Nah, I'm not doing that. Wrong channel, my brother. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I got Rabbi Wentworth right here, right here. You want to start there? There's a black Jew. That's the only black Jew you need to know. Um, molasses. <laughs> molasses so now you see that come on i'm spelled molasses wrong not molasses in january uh okay let's go 1788 so you see in philadelphia that what imported in the schooner fortune from cape francois and for sale peter borger and water street this is arch and race this is in philly molasses Right, so this molasses is just what gets, gets gets manufactured into rum, and many of those imports are coming into um, Rhode Island in particular. And this is that production that is being done. And this is how that trade is is um, working. Right, so you have 1784. You got Jamaica spirits, New England rum. You see that New England rum, sugar. Molasses, super fine and common flour, best Philadelphia bar iron, also a few barrels of tar or whatever. But what are they selling in 1784 in Newport, Rhode Island? New England rum. So where are they getting this from? They're getting the cane and the molasses runoff from those areas, like you're talking about the Caribbean, uh, Grenada and Jamaica and all those things. And that's how they get involved in it. So who are these people in Rhode Island? That's when you go and do your research and you start to have tangible, incredible, and factual ways of discussing the things that people want to talk about instead of just throwing, you know, stuff that make you feel good, calling them all type of names and not having no historical foundation to do it. That's the difference. And I, and it's funny that we ended up here and I say this, but that's the I think one of the problems, like, yo, you ruin all this stuff because there is validity in some of the things you're saying, but how you're approaching it is just all backwards because they can't run from the history of Jews of Rhode Island. Of it, when you're trying to But see, that's what they try to do. Truth, they try to run from the history. No, but it's not the point of running. But if you want to have, you can have a conversation with somebody when you want to go and immediately attack them and just say all type of crazy names. You, This is what I'm saying. Woketopians just don't know how to play chess. And this is why you end up just looking like bu- buffoons the whole time. Because they know we lead with our heart on a sleeve because it's a sensitive subject. I agree but at some with that. point, you have to realize, like, yo, they using that against me because they know that I lead with my heart with this because it's a sensitive subject. Not saying you shouldn't be emotional about it, but you got to understand if you lead with just emotion while you out there as a soldier, what happens to you? You end up putting a black glove on, punching the window, and jumping the fuck out of it. Are you not listening? I got you. I understand, and that's what's happened. And that's what has been happening with with us. I totally follow you. So, so when you want to have this, it's like this isn't fucking Hitler's speech or this nutty stuff that people. This is from where loc dot gov. Do you understand the difference in how you do things? This is from the mm-hmm. Library of Congress. This isn't from Saquon's uh, renditions of Judaic whatever. <laughs> Not then fake quads, you stupid. Reference for things. Portuguese settlement where in south southeastern New England can be traced to Newport, Rhode Island during the colonial period. In the 1650s, several Portuguese Jews moved to Newport from New York City, which I've told you a million times, after seeking refuge in Holland. So now you go back to the areas that you guys are obsessed with, or where did the Jewish people have to go to? And I keep going, you're not looking at Holland. That was the place that they went when they got kicked out. So when that happens, 
they have this impact where they then go where where the Dutch East and West India Company goes, and now they're in Recife, Brazil. Guess what they bring to Recife, Brazil? Sugar production. Well, good Lord, where would they get the sugar production? Then that would take you right back to where your Woktopian fantasies lie and realize that when it came from Asia, they were the ones enslaving, check this out, Moors and the ones that they call Negroes because they had this art of sugar making before it even came to America. It was in Portugal and Spain. But you see, so then you come here and says these exiles were joined by 90 Jews from Curacao. And I keep saying, well, hey, guys, it's the ABC Islands. Maybe they'll remember that. I say as simple as possible, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, all under Dutch control. Because then they'll see the East. I tried for so many years. Like the same thing. Here you go. In the last decade of the 17th century and others directly from Portugal during half of the 18th century. Among the latter immigrants was Aaron Lopez, who was born in Lisbon. He settled in Newport and seven years later helped to construct Toro Synagogue. Around New York and around some of your hoods, you see Toro College and you think that it's a Puerto Rican university. Toro College is named after a Sephardic Jew. Huh? But like I said years ago, I know people won't catch this because that I had to learn this 10 years ago on the humble. Why? Because we were looking for Goldstein and Schmitzberg and all that and not understanding the impact of Iberian culture. Just like we understand the impact of this Christian Protestant culture. When somebody looks, you know, 100 years from now it was John Smith. They put in the book Black or White. He could have been black. He could have been white. Well, we're looking for Smithburg and Shippenstein when they have Iberian or Latin names like Lopez because they are Sephardic. The Steens and all that other stuff comes when you have Ashkenaz or Eastern. Oh, I'm not going to let you stay in uh, there. Anyway, Toro. Uh, so anyway, you see these things. The busy and prosperous port of Newport is depicted on a Revolutionary War era map. Lopez's Wharf is identified near the center of the harbor area. With the letter K. What did you have to make up and be all anti-what? When you know that Newport was also the slave port? Was also, well, everything involved... The slave in port, yes, it was. So now, this is what I do. Now, this part should come together. Now, folks, watch. Watch. I talked about this triangular trade a million times. People won't get it. They, they laugh at the way I try to present it. Now, you'll hopefully get this part. You can see it in real specific ways. Right? What is the national dish of Jamaica? It is aki and saltfish. Any coconuts in the room? Am I lying? Aki and saltfish. Yes? Well, where did the aki come from? There goes your West African influence. There goes one piece of the triangle. We know that it's in Jamaica. There goes another piece of the triangle. Well, the key is, well, where did the saltfish come from? Ain't no damn saltfish around nobody's coconut lands. The saltfish came from New England. Anybody listening? That was the trade. You get this soft face while you can package it up and later you can, you can make it you can last out there and have them like, you know, boom, eating that. In exchange, we want the runoff from the sugar cane, some sugar cane as well, molasses, so we can what? Manufacture rum. Well, what about the African part? Well, where did you think the rum was going? Mm. This is where black folks say, yo, you better get offline. Stop. You being too real. Well, the rum, I just, this is where I bring Terry in here. Terry, do y'all drink rum in England? He go, nah, we don't really drink rum like that. Well, you know it wasn't going to England. 
Well, where would why would they make rum in New England and then send it back to Jamaica? Well, that don't make sense. Well, oh yeah, there was people in America drinking rum or whatever, but where was the rum going? The rum was going to the other part of the triangle to West Africa to make them alcoholics and such in exchange for your black behind. This is also why the two things that are locked in, this is the sacred science, and y'all welcome to Cash App is History Man 718 for this last one here. The two things that you can now see when you look at syncretized religion systems, you have the two elements of the slave trade within them. Tobacco and rum. And alcohol. All, all the spirits. Damn. Particular rum. Mm -hmm. Damn. My fault, Jesus Christ, I ain't see you here. Let me get you in here. Huh? Ooh, wee. You just made it uglier than it had to be, bro. True story and a blow up the place. Big up yourself, true. <laughs> Christ says. Yeah, I say, Savio. Peace. Yo, true, you kind of went way around my question, but I'm going to carry you back. This is something I have to ask uh, with the Warptopian and the identity thing. Do you think it's a problem because people, they say uh, the free people, all right, I already know the dominant culture and the lingua franca, but the free people and their approach to create themselves were emulating the dominant culture, which people don't like because they can, you know, it's a white culture, basically. It's a European culture and, and every aspect they come with that, the good and the bad. But then at the same time, the, the people being released from slavery or in the common world adopted the perversion of that culture that was presented to them in a menstrual cycle. And this is the conundrum that people are caught in over here when it comes to an identity is that they feel right. Right. when they Watch do a certain this. thing, they still are emulating what white people set as a standard. But if they do now what they consider to be black, it's actually a perversion of that culture that was given to them as an identity that they actually play and live out now. Yes, but it, it gets like this. So now I wanna, I mean, hey, if you guys ask the right questions, then I'll put more of the pieces together. And thank you for putting that in the chat, the hoodie. So here you go. Remember names like E.W. Clay and Mordecai Noah that we talked about earlier in this presentation? Well, E.W. Clay, this is yeah, the hoodie, I'm telling you. If they only know the stuff that's in my crazy shroomed out mind. So E.W., we're going to do this together so y'all can show it's no sleight of hand. I'm going to show the correlation to what you said about basically this, this desire to look like these white folks or the upper class, right? Um, don't forget that. That's what we that's what we going on this journey with right here. So I'm gonna share this screen and I'm gonna go right here. And I'm gonna go walk them because they were familiar. They should be with E.W. Clay that we mentioned did something called Life in Philadelphia with those images. Matter of fact, here's his tab still open. Yes. Everybody remember this part? Can I get one yes? No? Well, E.W. Clay. I remember. E.W. Clay does Life in Philadelphia with the pictures that are racist uh, co collection of images about black folks. Life in Philadelphia, he also did Life in New York as well. There was also uh, Traeger's Black Jokes. I don't want to get into all of that, right? So, but my point is Clay went to, let's go back to Clay's life. I'm going to get to your point. Edward Clay goes to, they don't give too much of it here. But he goes to Europe and he learns from the masters of political cartoons named like Rolandson and things like that, right? So Thomas Rolandson and all these other people are making fun of, here, let's do this. This is where it comes from. It's not just us. They just put it on us. They were making fun of the white folks in Europe who are known as the, 
you can put it here, middle class. But if we go to history, it's got to so you see it comes from the middling class, right? Of those people who are trying to get above their status to be something else, right? Now, I want to find it because I can't, uh, what is it? Life in England, maybe? Life in England. Who is it? It's not Rolanson. It's the other one. Um, oh, damn. Life in England. Is it Rolanson? I got it in my archive.org. Let me see if I can find it this way to show y'all. That's the thing. I ain't even opened up the life, the um, archive.org yet. So Rolanson. It comes from them, y'all, making fun of other white folks trying to be a part of these middling class. And this is where they start to make fun of the dandies and the fops. Those are those people of England. But this isn't the one. It's, um, it's the two brothers. Y'all going to get me way off in this stuff, man. I could get way crazy with this shit. It's, it's two brothers who do the artwork and Clay goes to learn the style and this is oh, this is where you get this whole life in London series, right? And so they're looking at these people now, trying to make a come up and be this middling class. That's where you get middle class from. These people trying to be above their station and, and failing at doing it or making mockeries of doing it. They take that characterization and then put it on us as you trying to be white. You understand what I'm trying to say, Jesus? So when Clay learns these stuff. Yes, I, I. You know, I know this part from my studies yeah, yeah, yeah. in literature. Yeah. But so see, my whole question was the conundrum with, with, with the Black youth and the people today. They feel like they're caught in a bind. Because right, like, I, like I said yesterday. That's what I'm trying to, 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 to get at. Like, how do they deal with that? And I think that's one of the problems here when, when you get to this identity quest because everything that they consider right is of another culture is arab is more is is yeah. emulating the lingua franca of this culture and the standards that these people set but then everything that you consider this you is an adoption of a perversion from you from a play from a yeah. from a play you understand a so then I right. said that creates some type of some type of psychological uh, uh, disconnect right there. You know what I mean? I say... Yes, I like to say... Yes, it does. Like said, and they're caught in the, in the middle of something, and this is America. where this identity crisis is actually embedded in, is what I'm trying to get at. Yes, the identity crisis is rooted in the fact that we're trying to take missions of definition and not being told what our origin is or who we are. So we're going out there with the attitude of I'm this, this, that, or this, and I'm not this, not that, and not having any truth. And what I mean by that, and that sounded a little convoluted the way I put it, but we go through this whole existence, and the only thing that you can hold on to with, with, with uh, such sincerity is that your ass was a slave, right? And we don't even know what that means. We just know that I got to deal with hardship, suffering, and this is how I can define myself and the crazy stuff that I see, whether it's violence, ignorance, or the way that I'm treated, right? But I keep saying, when we look at it, the biggest trick was not to present, you know, hey, go ahead and keep your enslavement story in there. But if you added the story of free Black people, that's the one that shakes the whole foundation. Because then you have to explain, well, what was the biggest impediment of y'all doing good in 2023? Well, let's go to the videotape. Every time these free black folks were trying to get this stuff going, what was their biggest impediment? Then you just stop and stand quiet. Next person talks, loses. We don't understand that because we don't know the story. Well, wait a minute. He keeps saying that these people was doing all this stuff. We going, what happened? Okay, what was in the way? You got to worry about getting blackbirded. You got to worry about getting lynched. You got to worry about getting falsely accused. You got to worry about them to put you on the boat to Liberia or maybe Sierra Leone. You got to worry about this, that, and the other thing. Hmm? You got to worry about second class citizen. Can I sit in the back of the car, in the front of the car? Can I live here? Can I do this? Let I live in the basement? Anytime. Now you're free. There's no excuse for that treatment. 
But what they're telling you, and like I keep saying, okay, you may be free, but you will never be equal. Mm, so, so this, so basically, so basically, and I, and and this is something I think pe- I understand what you mean by people be not they be missing it, because even though they were free, they still had to live by the laws and the codes of the land. Not just that, Sabio. When you walk out the crib, niggas is singing "Oh Susanna." You could be snatched up, right? 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 Niggas singing "Oh Susanna." Right? People are walking around, and the root of American music is the songs mocking you. Right. So even though you might be, even though you might be, even though you might be rich, might be free. Even though you might be rich, you might be free. You still have these songs that are mocking you being sung by other people that looks like you. So this is the popular idea of you, even though you're what? Upper class or you might be considered upper class or what they would consider an uppity Negro. That's a that's a very very deep dynamic to live through not knowing you know and then like 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 you were saying you could be snatched up at any time even though you might have um you might have been from a well to do family like damn trying to try to carve out an identity Wait, what with you all this it, Sabio. Sabio just think about it right now if you in the hood right now, right, through the imagery, the true story and just showed you and this, this and that and the people, yo, that, that whole image is snatched away from you. That identity is just a character come out of a play. Wait, you hold on. Jesus, Jesus, right? Jesus. Now Jesus, let's say you. if, you, if Jesus, you're trying listen, to live bro. by the standards and you like a reverend butts of them people, now you assimilating into the white culture still and rear, 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 and then that can be snatched away from you. When people start pointing right. out at this and we this and that. So, so now you're left. This is what I'm saying. This is where the modern people are at. This is why we have this conflict going on. This is, in my opinion, that's how I say it. Like my brethren like to say, in my opinion, from what I see, because the people now, they're not left with nothing. So now anything can come in and fulfill that void. But I'm where true story in is. From me reading all type of literature, and doing this and that and going to the college and all of them thing there and getting my degrees, I started to see the connection, almost like in a quantum world where this thing is so connected mm-hmm. and interluded and, and convoluted, you can never tell it in a linear um, fashion. And that's what makes that. the whole story and so his method of and his approach to giving you the history, it's almost like a quantum approach to history because every time you go into one nugget, it reverse upon itself and reverse it by itself and connect to this and connect to that to where you start like <laughs> the truth is this but the truth is constantly revolving around what it is if you understand what me saying and and it's similar to our identity be constructed in that way to where we're Listen. constantly evolving and revolving around the, this dynamic we're saying which, today which, which is a posit between two things that we never created like we didn't create the, the culture that we're trying to emulate and we didn't create the perversion mm. of that culture that we adopted as an identity. So your choice is so we're trying to say on. today, look, one of the arguments that we have today or, or, or things that are discussed is the impact of this rap culture, hip hop culture, whatever it is, and how it's affecting the babies. Yes. And people, you know, it'd be sensitive because when we get down to it, it's, it's kind of sensitive for us to deal with, but we're, you know, I'll just use myself as an example. You can't tell me that when I was growing up, the stuff that I was seeing as far as uh, just whether the movies or the culture was not influential, what was taking place in my hood. So I'm not one of them liars, and I'm not going to say the kids of today. I'm going to tell you how it really was in the 90s and then in the 80s. That's Y'all true. not too popping in New York right now. And, and, them, and them people was in the hood, too, as well. So it got confusing. Way early on was a life imitated or art imitated life. Now, with all of that said, we ask those questions in 2022 with what's going on today. What I'm asking people to do is, okay, if you can take that concept today, can you imagine 
what it's like at this point when popular culture throughout America is barbecuing you. It's telling right. you that the image of you completely comes from a white person in burnt cork acting like that, talking like that. That's what a Negro is. Well, you have zero control over that. Damn. And then at the same time, when you walk down the street, you could be snatched up, killed, do whatever, or your only option of hope is to get on that boat and go to Liberia. Do mm -hmm. you understand mm -hmm. why people said, well, damn it, I might as well take my shot and go to Liberia. But the ones who stayed did what? They started abolition and anti-slavery mm -hmm. societies to get the rest of their brothers and sisters free but yet the woke topians poo poo on their history and call them moors jews and indians mm -hmm. the disrespect has to stop because those people knew what they were and they knew what they were fighting for and they knew what they were trying to change. And they weren't fighting for no Jews, no Moors, no none of that. They was fighting for Africans and Africans in America whose images and lives were being told by a whole nother race of people. We just have to understand that what I'm trying to do in a roundabout way is show us that yo, we never owned our image or the representation of us it is dictated by other people and it's a mold that was created that we had to fit into it's a mold that was created by ethiopians and the crazy twilight zone part is those ethiopians were not ethiopians ethiopians they were white men in blackface right that's the killer that that's is the like the old what you're trying to fit in and i told mm, you mm, it comes mm. from the sciences because they validate it with the descriptions and the ways that blumenbach laid it out wow man this well i could take this conversation deeper but i'm not because that blumenbach shit goes back to some greek shit but you know i ain't gonna even go that far we can't like, they all damn, do, all you've done is add it to, to show why they chose that as exoticness. Exactly. Time, yeah. Got Negroes and Negroes and that whole thing. Well, no, these aren't just Negroes on their plantation. Our Negroes have a sense of exoticness and are the true essence of what this Negro is. Thus, we'll use one of these scientific names and call ourselves Ethiopians. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. But look, I, I got it now. I mean, I got, I got some, I got a few. Y'all, y'all picked the right day. I got a few minutes a day. I just need to get me some grub. But hold on, I, like I don't want people to think once again that I'm trying to make this as something that it's not, or trying to sound all like. Add, you can ask Khalil. I struggle with with a lot of this because, like, yo, this is real. I don't want to add my opinion to none of this. I want you to understand when I say Ethiopian opera and they took and perverted classical Europe and made it the American form calling it the Ethiopian opera, that it's called an Ethiopian opera. Come on, don't try to make me look bad. There you go, I got a million of them. Ethiopian operas are what they're called and where they held. Now I'll put it all together. You see the hypeness in my voice because now I can show you. I told you at Barnum's. I told you it was the American Museum. I told you Barnum is the father of show business in America. All these fathers popping up. Well, what did you go and see at Barnum's? You went to go and see the Japanese, this, the red snapper from Cuba, and you got your own special section at Barnum's of who? Woods Minstrels, accompanied by Mr. Woods Quartet Brass Band, under the supervision of S.H. Butterworth, the best band of who? Ethiopian minstrels, Ethiopian personators in the country. I'll put it bigger so you see it. They appear every Ethiopian afternoon. Ethiopian impersonators? And Ethiopian operas, huh? Children under 10, 15 cents, and to the parquet, 10 cents extra. Children, and it's American culture. This is at Barnum's. 
you know, the guy with the circus. These were the popular amusements of the day. And you were not, uh, listen, let me show you how real this is. Now you don't got me upset. Listen, I'm going to go slow with this for black folks. The Cash App is History Man 718. We're in overtime now. This is how you were given to the world. You know about Joyce Heath, maybe. So I done showed you before we get down. Let's look up. You see this right here? Let's look up what is it. Let's go. What is it? And I'm going to put Barnum in there. Look what how you were brought to the world. What is it, exhibit? Hmm. Hmm. Huh? What is it you will find is an African-American dude who was retarded that they said was the missing link? Mm. Huh? You know, that's what I'm saying. Leave me back in the clutches because y'all don't want me to really tell y'all what happened to us. This is what is it? Huh? That's a black man that they were going to see at Barnum's Museum. Hmm? This is what they I've told seen you that picture. So they're going to see, let's go back to where we were. They're going to see who, what is it, or the man monkey. That's how you get presented. Or you can see the albino family. Did you know that they had albino minstrels too? Huh? Or you can see the Ethiopian and excuse me, not all the Ethiopian opera. You're presented as someone who has a I don't want to say what is it, what's the correct word for retard? I don't want to say it. Deformity. Wrong, deformity, thank you. Um, um, and in the albino family, or you can see the real Ethiopians who are white men, and this is popular culture and amusement in America. Do you really want the truth? Come on, son. It's a plan. <laughs> Leave I've me seen in that the picture. back chamber, yo. Leave me in the back chamber, yo. Y'all don't want me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hmm? Wow. Huh? That is popular culture. Culture. That is entertainment. That's not off-brand with some KKK thing. It is the foundation of American popular culture. I say this with confidence so you understand to research it so you can too. There was no ifs, ands, buts about it. I showed you who so, the first black star is, Jim Crow, Daddy Rice. I showed you what the first American native popular culture was. Did I not? And I tell you, mm, I still mm, take mm. the bet and stand on it and nobody can show me different. Every so, unquote scholar will say so. So um this so this would be basically what you could call I don't was Sarah Barman earlier before this or was she around the same Sarah time? Sarah Barman's around the same time, it, but that uh -huh, comes from uh -huh. this is where you, you don't have museums as you know them yet. You think because you heard some old Roman or Greek museum, like, there ain't no museums like that. Barnum comes up with that concept, and the concept is this. You're dealing with some people who are the low culture. That's why it is. Popular culture is low culture. It's, that's the distinction and difference between high culture, which you give to the classics, which are the ones that come from Europe, which is the ones that nobody goes to or likes. Low culture is disgusting and has to appeal to these people in this fashion, and they, forbid, and they pull on the lowest parts of our nature. This is why we are obsessed with the sickest stuff on Internet. It's not a coincidence. That's what people do. Like, we are low culture people. It is just salacious and they know how to present it to us. It's not just learned stuff that gets the most views on the internet, is it? No. It's the stuff that's sick and twisted. We just don't want to come to grips with how disgusting we really are. That's part of the problem. We run from it. If, if learning and knowledge and if stuff was popular, then that mean everybody be doing it. No. What's popular? The disgusting stuff. So then they know how to repeat it over and over again. And that's where you get it. And just, I, I just jumped on in to add to how um, the things are intertwined. 
because that whole Barnum thing with that particular black dude that they claimed was, you know, the missing link between beast and, and humans was during the 1860 elec election. So nice. that's a, how it got tied politically. And again, it's supposed to be based on that election uh, being the whole idea of slavery being a prominent part of that election of 1860. But again, they use the popular culture to have people confused about whether or not we as black people should be enslaved or supposedly freed. So and definitely just, and definitely not get the vote. Absolutely. Remember, remember, you watched yesterday. Remember what Mordecai Noah said in 1821? Because he said that the black folks that was at that ice cream garden that they was making for were making organizations and they thought that they had the power to get together and win the elections and vote. That's 1821 when that's that free population trying to do stuff. And so the whole time they say the vote don't matter. This voting season, y'all. And look where we are. So why are you, why are you bent on trying to take it away? Damn. I, do, people, do people pay attention to history? I don't think people really pay attention to history. And that's the problem, truth story. And the more you pull this shit out, the more the more I recognize that there's been a lot of things that we have been told not to pay attention to because we haven't been given the tools to look for the information, but also because we don't want to look for the history. We want the feel good history, like you say, and that, that doesn't get listen, us man, anywhere. Listen, this, this is, this is the, at the root of, of the experience of those people who are defining themselves. Like, right. It's like you realize that you have these scars on you so bad that you just don't want to rip off the band-aid sometime that you but those see people had no choice but to deal with that hold on let me finish but you can't just rip off the band-aid off to take a look at it and not understand it once they get that oxygen in that air that that's a part of the healing we wanted to just put designer band-aids on it not realizing like yo son you know it's just gonna fester under up under there you got to do something with it but it hurts too much it hurts too much to realize, yo, damn, we took an L here. We took an L here. They got us here. Yeah, but that's how they presented it. You don't understand there's two sides to the story. Well, if you took so many L's and you've been defeated, how the hell is your ass here in 2022 to tell a story? You're not talking to an Aztec or an Inca. They're gone. But yet yeah, you're here in 2022. So it was something that's happened that's missing the story that got me. And yes, it's not the greatest position, but I may be here. Huh, what held that together? Then you start to see, well, damn, that's the stuff that's missing from the books. Hmm? Because like I said yesterday, they want you to think your way up out of this is go and get the extendo. They want you to think that. They send a robot in for Micah Johnson and kill Joe Greens almost, what, a decade ago now? Hmm. That's not it. They start the COINTELPRO and all these other programs not for your weaponry to disrupt your ability to organize. They, Mordecai Noah in his African amusements is attacking who? Black organizations. E.W. Clay, when you look at life in Philadelphia and those drawings, if you look at the cartoons, there's a black folks going to either quadrilles or abolition meetings and stuff like that. Hmm? Trying to say anything you got as organization is entertainment and not to be taken seriously. Popular culture is a weapon. So like I say, if in my twisted way, let me add this. Well, we're at this story where here you go. Isn't this the point where Kyrie joins the NOI and comes back Kyrie X for the whole thing? No. That's even long gone because the organizations are gone. Is anybody listening? Ain't even got old boy to come out there and with his old spark and fire because he know the troops ain't even really there. He got to look the old Nori in this one. Hmm? Just this not answering people's questions? <laughs> I 
How does that answer that for you? This is the Can part you in the hear me in the back? When Cassius, when Cassius go to Elijah and and and, and Reem go over to who he went to the Sunnis and 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 Q go to to, to um Farrakhan. This is the part in the movie when it happens, ain't it? Oh, that don't happen no more. Ain't no organizations for that. And my people are Scientologists. <laughs> Huh? And I said this last night. This is one of my last things. We have been relegated to the entertainment that they say we are because this whole time and these whole issues have been wrapped around two of our richest people and out there, and they're what? Dunkers and dancers. This is all we are to them. Dunkers and dancers, y'all entertainment pieces because when we look to these type of things and issues look at our bar uh, uh, lights of hope dunkers and dancers from oprah to hove or whatever else hmm? so by our just mere essence even our brightest hope is what dunkers and dancers See how real it could get? Why y'all better leave me back in the cave somewhere? I'm not here. Like, look, it's nasty. Can you hmm? hear me in the back? I got to take this to the usual suspects right now. Because that you was some too? shit. You just flipped the whole Indeed. table, bro. You just flipped over the whole damn table. Hmm? You just we flipped don't the whole table over. If we don't have these discussions or whatever, how are we really going to you know, deal with it? How are we really going to try to understand? Of course, it's going to be nasty and it's going to hurt. That's part of healing, man. We ain't, you ain't seen that already. But, you know, we can lie and say, oh, you're, you're just making fun of our situations. Like, at some point, we have to understand, yes, things have been systematic against us, but there's accountability that comes in there at some point if you're going to make a change. Hmm? Hmm? I'm not saying that the weight is equal, but you got to take some accountability. Like, yo, okay, you're not going to PP in the staircase elevator and no need to curse like that walking down the street in front of all those women. So what? doesn't make you edgy or tough. Now, as a product of youth and rebellion, I give room for that. But the point, and I'm not trying to get all high in mind, it's just something is missing now. It's not just the youth. There's the older people, too. And, you know, COVID did a lot to people. There's a whole lot of stuff not talking about. I'm just talking about as far as, like, socialization and mentally, which has been going on on a greater scale. It's not just black people. It's the planet in general. But it's affected us even more because of, you know, where we are and who we are. That's the stuff we really don't want to deal with. We got issues. Don't mean hopeless. It means, like, yo, let's deal with this shit so we can try to push. But at the end of the day, Wotopia says, no, I'm going to go with the light and the nature, wink, wink. And at the end of the day, in the ninth inning, to show you how crazy it all is, who will you go into Kwanzaa season with as the number one representatives of the Wotopia mind? Ron Dalton. <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> He's an asshole. <laughs> Yo, I know Cedric. Cedric is a smart dude or whatever. The Hilly, they gonna appreciate this, but look, they don't got your monkey behind on CNN, on MSNBC, on TMZ. The Wotopians done missed the dodge the bullet because they ain't blow polite and nature boy up, and now they don't put you from the frying pan into the fire when every time your woke told me you heard Shaq and Barkley talk about consciousness and consciousness there's no escape for you woke topians don't you try to back off your conscious stuff now they got Shaq and Charles Barkley talk about this nutty woke topianism and don't try to act like <laughs> they know a distinction between you to Zariag or, or the third most the third over there huh all the same Oh shit! Yeah, Wokeopia they got threw under the goddamn bus with that last statement. Kyrie done fucked it all up. Right, like and you think you the high and mighty one? I don't know, but no, it's all the same <laughs> to them. 
I mean, Kanye, Kanye, Kanye had already did his damage, you know, with his dumbness. Nick Cannon with his idiocy a couple years ago. Now you have this on top of it. It's like, how much can, how, how, how low can we go? Oh, no, 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 no. You want to see just in time for you to light that candle on Kwanzaa. They're not done with you. All of you are going to apologize for even thinking like you think before it's all over. <laughs> the best that you can be at the end of this is end up like a buck like Nick Cannon. Huh? Uh, uh, uh. Mm, mm, mm. Huh? Man, do do I mean, I, I mean, I just been looking at the Kyrie situation. Like Nike even kicked his ass. Like, dude, you, everybody just basically you know. did you like, like. Well, well, that, like, well in, 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 in a way, they have their right and they have their choice, and I'm not mad at that decision. What you do is like you understand. Well, okay, well, obviously, you didn't know how to do no business at all well what it, what it goes to me is this and now and i'll say this so now you have a point where huh i'm from brooklyn i'm brooklyn like it's all in my bloodstream well hey is anybody stopping to think that this started with jay-z even letting this go and this was seems like another uh, a century ago huh well, hey, this was all promised to be the one thing that was going to be different and the black folks was going to have a place and a say and not be totally displaced from this Brooklyn that that particular area was ours to begin with. Huh? Well, now look in there and you understand that, damn, can a Negro who still remain and live around there afford to go to a Nets game? Huh? And you understand, can a Negro who used to live around there can afford to live around there right now? You understand the game was much bigger than Kyrie, Kevin Durant, or anything else. And it has to do with something that, once again, we're not looking at is the total displacement of black folks. And there's some crazy migration of some sorts going on. And we're not going to be aware of it until we're completely displaced and sipping out of some, you know, infested pool water for survival. Because it's not just Brooklyn, Chicago, uh, Boston, Philly, even Atlanta. Huh? So that's what happened when you look, well, wait a minute, all this is going on and ain't nothing about that says Brooklyn or blackness or anything related to it. But no one apologizes for that lie. Hmm? Told you leave me in the background, yo. <laughs> you see the game like, yo, y'all don't even understand how wicked this is. Like, yo, wait a minute. First of all, we can't even afford to go see Kyrie play. So what do we care? And this is being a hundred with you. Hmm? And the Barclays has the worst sound ever. And it happens to be through only when the black. I went to see J. Cole. I told you I was terrible. Y'all saw on the internet how Mary J. went there and it was Tebo. What's the boy named Fibio, Fabio, whatever. Go there and it's terrible. I'm telling you. Way deeper than you think. You worrying about some Kyrie. Like, wait a minute. I'm looking in here like, we just can't afford to go to this. No way. Like, what are you talking about? Hmm? On that note, thank you for tuning in. I hope you learned at least one new thing um, and be able to share with somebody. Um, I generally appreciate all of the support and uh, we got to take back some part of us physically. We got to get keep up out these prisons and out that they control mentally. We got to take back our image. Like, unless we're saying that this is the image that we want, everybody throwing their platinums and pull down your mouth so everybody can see a smile, you know? So through it all, they may be in the worst conditions. We still going to have them smiling and beguiling. Does anybody see the psychology yet? We out here looking bad and crazy, murder, death, kill, but everybody's smiling, pulling on their lip to show it's okay as long as I got my platinum. <laughs> as long as I got some gold, as long as I got my grip.
Yeah. So once again, I ask, is it life imitating art or art imitating life? Mm. So on that note, mm. Mm. I say if you want to support Peace. one more time, the cash yeah, Big up, brother. True story. History, history man, 718. Other than that, you know, each one, teach one. Teach one. Yeah, I'm not, not going to lie to y'all. I'm, I'm going to tell you this part right here. As far as I'm concerned, I like the Hamptons beaches. Okay? I like La Jolla. I like some of that stuff. I'm not giving it up because everybody on like, like them beaches. The difference is, I'll tell you, you can sit around and get the free drinks and chill when you understand, like, you know what? This is a teaching moment for them, too. And I kid you not. The same stuff in the same way that I share with the woke topians, I share with them, and they paid for it. <laughs> and you can ask Rob on, I don't change a word of what I say. Deuces.